We are recording. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Hopkinton School Board meeting for Thursday, March 4th, 2021. We have uh, a full board, actually almost a full board with us here this evening. Um, we have Rob Nato, Norm Guppel, Andrew Folsom, and myself, Jim O'Brien. Uh, we'll be joined by Seth Aframe a little later um, during the meeting. And then we have our student reps, Juliet Shahade and Mia Richter. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and Michelle Clark, our business administrator, and uh, Mr. Steve Chamberlain, superintendent of schools. Um, so thank you all very much. We're going to start with the uh, a Pledge of Allegiance. And we're going to change it up a little bit. Today we're showing a picture of the high school with a flag and some roof work. Can you see that flag? We sure can. So what's going on, Steve, in the picture? This is the uh, extended roof work that we did as our first round of an alt. It's the front by the bus drop off heading through. And so all this will be done. And, and as Mr. Gupa likes to say, we're going to be leak free at the high school. <laughs> all right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Leak free sounds like a very good goal. Um, appreciate that. All right, um, so we are, uh, we're here today, um, once again, meeting as a board fully remotely. So there's no physical location for our meeting uh, this evening. And we're able to do this because of the governor's um, emergency declaration due to the COVID-19 pandemic and emergency orders that allows for um, uh, public bodies such as the Huffington School Board to conduct our business um, fully remotely. And so we do have um, both a Zoom link as well as a telephone um, call-in number that was provided as part of the notice for this meeting. Um, members of the public are able to, um, uh, to attend the meeting and hear the conversation in real time. We also have two opportunities during the course of this meeting for members of the public to provide public comment to the board. And those, um, there'll be one coming up here shortly at the, at the front end of the meeting. And then there's a second opportunity um, towards the end of the meeting for members of the public to provide comments. Um, all other aspects of RSA 91A or the state's right to know law will be followed um, as well as uh, minutes of the meeting will be uh, made available per the statute. Uh, and then for those who have um, attended or watched a board meeting, the only other change that you, well, aside from being fully remote, that you might notice um, is that uh, for every vote that the board does, they're all roll call votes. And so that does take a few extra moments um, to move through. So with that, um, I'll ask Steve, are there any um, additions or deletions in the agenda here this evening? So hopefully I put in a, a just an addition to our Schedule B nomination slate of Mr. George Sable as the assistant track coach. And then when we get to interscholastic sports, we're just gonna just talk briefly about, about allowing a few uh, family members to support the end of season's awards in person in the gym. So those are the only additions. Perfect. Um, and then any correspondence this, this evening? I think there were three correspondence or so that were placed in the meeting folder provided to the board. Great. Um, and so we have a couple sets and I just lost my agenda. Excuse me, we have a couple sets of minutes to approve this evening. Um, and so I would ask if there is a motion for the Huffington School Board to approve the minutes of the public hearing held on February 18th, 2021. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All right, hearing none, um, Rob. Rob Nato, yes. Norm? Norm Gupal, yes. Andrea? Andrea Folsom, yes. And Jim O'Brien is a yes, so those minutes are approved. Um, is there a motion for the Hoppington School Board to approve the minutes of the regular board meeting held on February 18th, 2021? So moved. Second. Any discussion on those minutes? All right, seeing none, Rob? Rob Nato, yes. Norm? Norm Gupal, yes. Andrea? Andrew Folsom, yes. And Jim O'Brien is yes. So those minutes are approved. And last set, is there a motion for the Hopkinton School Board to approve the minutes of the non-public session held on February 18th, 2021? So moved. Second. 
All right, any discussion? Hearing none, Andrea. Andrea Folsom, yes. Norm? Norm Gupla, yes. Rob? Rob Nato, yes. And Jim O'Brien is yes. So those minutes are approved. Um, so this brings us to our first public comment portion of the evening. And so um, those who are attending, if you have a, a comment that you wish to provide to the board, just um, move your cursor, mouse, um, pointer, whatever it is towards the bottom of your screen. There should be a raise hand button. If you, if you press on that, that lets us know that you have a comment that you'd like to give. And I would just ask um, those who do give comments just to provide us with your name and address, if you would, for the minutes. And then um, if you can try to limit your comments to about three minutes. So with that, if anybody has a comment, um, I'll give it a minute to, for a hand to go up. And as I said, there's a, there's a second opportunity towards the end of the meeting um, as well for public comment. All right, uh, so Darlene Gildersleeve. Uh, there we go, darling. Good Hi, evening. Can you hear me okay? We sure can. Okay. Um, I want to talk about returning to in-person learning um, 100%. Uh, students with serious underlying conditions, um, I realize that there is a concern, you know, for their health. Um, however, they can do synchronous remote learning, um, just like my daughter has done. Um, whenever she feels, you know, quite ill from her bone tumor and other underlying medical conditions, um, she just hops right on the computer with her, um, her school. And whenever she's well, which has been all week, thank God, and now part of last week, she's been attending 100% in person. Um, all the students in her private school um, have been doing really, really well attending 100% in person. Um, they are isolated and lonely at home and um, serious mental health issues are arising in our youth. I'm really, really, really disturbed by the calls and messages that I'm getting from parents um, all around the state. And actually in Hopkinton, there are parents that are reaching out to me and they're because there's still a stigma with mental health, unfortunately, they don't want to talk to the school board and come out, and especially in public input, to talk about it. And a resident last week, um, she actually got on public input and said that it was inappropriate, um, the comments that I made um, with her child nearby. But I'll tell you what, if you don't talk about suicide prevention and you don't talk about mental health in town, one fine day, it might be your child that has an issue. So we really have to talk about it and, um, and help assist the, these kids that are, you know, really truly suffering. It's painful for me when I get these messages and phone calls from parents that are crushed and their kids are shattered. And I feel like the board and uh, administration is not doing enough to move towards 100% in person. Um, not only, you know, a line, I know a lot of people in town are concerned about academics, but me, I, I'm more concerned with how are these kids even going to focus on academics when their mental health is so bad. So um, I, I really, really um, wish and hope that you'll take my comments to heart and move towards 100% in-person learning. And, um, and like I said, I have a child with very serious medical conditions and all she does is they, she has a laptop at home and she opens it up and then the laptop at school is facing her educators in her class. And so she can participate um, and not miss out on any assignments and not miss out on communicating with her teachers and her peers um, when she can't. So, I mean, there's that workaround. Um, the other thing is um, I, was, I was able to um, dial into a few meetings this week um, at the legislature, and I'm really concerned at the amount of money that the New Hampshire School Board Association is getting from our taxpayer money. And what the New Hampshire School Board Association is doing 
is they're sending lobbyists to the state house to testify against the best interest of our students. So to the parents that are listening, if you can log on to some hearings involving any educational matters and especially to education committee hearings for the House and the Senate, you can hear for yourself the lobbyist for the New Hampshire School Board Association actively speaking against special education, kids with disabilities, in all kinds of educational matters. I find it to be very upsetting that my taxpayer monies are being sent to the, for the budget in Hockington only to be turned around and used against my own kid. And I'm pretty and, horrified about that. So I think, um, I think yeah, that, that's, all, that's all I have for tonight. Thank, thank you, you, darling. Thank you, appreciate your comments. Thanks. And I'm not seeing any other hands raised. And so I am going to uh, close the public comment portion. And as I said, there will be another opportunity for public comments um, towards the end of our agenda this evening. And so I think I'll, well, the next item in the agenda is, uh, is school board comments. And so um, I'm gonna ask um, our, our student reps to start, kick us off if they have, um, um, any any comments that they'd like to give tonight? So um, I don't know, Mia or Juliet, either of you want to start or you, either of you have comments? I have a quick plug for the National Honor Society Blood Drive. It's March 17th from eight to two um, in the gym at the high school. And I believe you can, I believe the link to sign up is in the Hawk News, but um, you could also email me and I could send you information about it if anyone wants to sign up to donate blood. Perfect. Um, Steve, is that, is that a link that we could put onto the, is it on the district website or could we do that? We'll make sure we do that. So thank you. Great idea. But, yeah, thank you, Mia. Juliet, anything this evening? Um, I don't have any comments. Thank you though. Yeah, thank you. All right, um, any board member? Do you wanna go first, Andrew? Or you want me to go first? You want me to, okay, sure. Um, I just want to say thank you to the uh, PTA last night and thank you, Steve and Andrea, for joining me to go over our budget with them. It was great to see all of them and uh, really have a good discussion with them. And thank you to the PTA for all that they do for our community and for the district. Uh, I want to thank the community for all their um, phone calls and all their emails over the last couple of weeks. It's been a great discussion. Um, a lot of these community members just want to have uh, their voice heard and it's great to have that with them privately and to hear their thoughts and to listen. Um, Real quick, um, just my condolences to the Parr family. I, I realized that Coach Dan Parr passed away. And what's unique about that is Dan Parr was actually the coach of um, Hopkinton's men's basketball team when they won their first and only championship. That's going to change hopefully down the road with an additional championship. But what's unique about it is Coach Parr was actually one of the basketball coaches at my high school at St. Thomas, and he brought out the best in the students. And he was the Bill Belichick of men's basketball with a lot of championships. So my condolences to him. And when I first met Steve Chamberlain, we did a background check and I talked to him a little about basketball. He coached against Dan Parr and got crushed. And it was it was a uh, it was a really funny conversation and uh, but uh, my, just a full circle here, knowing that he was part of the Hopkinton School District and then at my uh, high school. Last thing is, Jim, a big shout out to Joan Fonsby's class. Their book came out today. It's the number one bookseller, um, the New York Times. All the students came out with their stories today and a lot of great photos in it. I look forward to reading it. Um, my daughter was very proud to bring this home today and um, just this is the type of work I like to see a lot of creative photos. Uh, I'm going to ask Bill next year that he puts his own photo in here at some point, but um, great job by the students. Great job by Joan. It put a smile on my face after a, a long week. So thank you guys. Thanks, Norm. Uh, Rob or Andrea? I can go next. Um, so I just wanted to, I know we've received a lot of um, emails and, and I've had a lot of great conversations with community members over the past year, but especially over the past week, um, a couple of weeks. And so I wanted to just 
publicly go over a couple of things. Um, I know sometimes it can be tricky tuning into these meetings. You know, our meetings are sometimes every week, sometimes every other week. They're supposed to be every other week, but it's been an exciting year. Um, and so I, I just wanted to touch publicly on a couple of things that we've talked about in our in our public meetings, um, but they're also kind of consistently going on in other meetings between um, the school board with administration, um, between administration and lead and teachers and staff. Um, so yeah, so a couple of things. I know that there has been chatter about um, spacing in schools and, and that's been a, a big um, sticking point and we're all worried about do we need three feet? Do we need six feet? And so we actually reached out to, um, our nurses reached out to the COVID-19 Education Liaison, um, who is with the Bureau of Infectious Disease and Control at the New Hampshire um, Division of Public Health Services. Um, and the, the information that we got back from her um, was, and I quote, the guidance has not shifted from the start of the school year. Currently, the recommendation is still six feet, um, but when unable to do six feet, no closer than three feet. It's important to know that if students are closer than six feet within a classroom, there will be more students excluded due to being a close contact if there are positive cases. Um, and I know that several times this year we've had some positive cases and we've actually been able to avoid having a large amount of either students or teachers needing to quarantine or self isolate um, because we've stuck to the, the six feet of um, separation between students. Um, I do hope that folks have a chance to look through the new CDC um, updates. So they, they came out on February 12th and they've continued to update them. The most recent update um, was February 26th and that's the operational strategy for K through 12 schools through phased mitigation, which is a very exciting title. Um, but more specifically to Hopkinton, excuse me. So if we take out the kind of the three feet and the six feet issue. The biggest thing is the the new CDC guidelines talk about different levels of um, risk, basically, which is something we've talked about all year long. And so there's low transmission, moderate transmission, substantial and high trans transmission rates. So right now we're we are in a substantial transmission rate. It's orange. Um, the recommendation right now from the CDC is elementary schools and hybrid learning um, and or with reduced attendance and middle and high schools in hybrid learning or reduced attendance and physical distancing of six feet or more is required. So we're in line with that. And this week, I think it's great that we were able, sort of speaking to Darlene's point, we were able to start um, doing our hybrid synchronous at the middle high school. We've offered remote um, option all year long for all students at all schools. And for high school students, middle high school students, we now have the synchronous hybrid option. So you are continuing to go through the curriculum um, throughout the week, whether or not you're in school or out of school. So just to touch quickly on current Hopkinton School District planning, um, just to make things super clear. So Steve talked a couple of weeks ago that he and Michelle were able to um, secure some more Title IV grants. I believe that's correct, Steve, they're Title IV. Um, to get some additional hours of supports for our elementary school students. Um, so we're happy to be able to offer that. We've heard about throughout the year, we've had um, the middle high school move through a couple of different, um, we've tried a couple of different things and now we've landed on our synchronous hybrid. And that's something that um, Mr. Kelly and Ms. Gagnon have said that they will continue to talk with the board about and they're gonna continue to look at it just as they've done all year long. Um, to move forward so that we can, you know, our intention is to get as many kids into the schools as safely as I, as we can with our mitigation strategies. Um, and then we are also talking with, um, let's see, I'm losing my notes. So we're, we're also continuing to plan and, and have meetings. We've been having meetings with the administration, the HEA and teachers, um, you know, for increased student attendance at the elementary schools. Um, just depending on, again, our, our risk levels, the CDC guidelines and changing circumstances and moving forward. Um, so I just wanted to make this last point really clear. So it's, it's our intention, barring some catastrophic occurrence, 
it's, it's our intention right now to be open for all schools and all students and staff as of August 30, 2021, if not sooner. We cannot guarantee sooner, um, but right now that is definitely our intention. I know that there have been you know, other things that have been thrown around and worries and concerns. I totally get that, but I just wanted to make these points really clear. We are having those meetings, they are ongoing, and it is our intention to, to open in a full in-person, you know, we may still be wearing masks, but we're hoping with um, the vaccinations that we're just hearing today are going to be hopefully happening much more quickly. Um, and again, it depends on if teachers are getting the single shot, the Johnson Johnson single shot, or if they need the double shot, which does take longer. Um, but our intention is to get all the kids back into school. Um, you know, it's, it's not our hope to keep them out. So thanks for letting me just ramble on there. But I just wanted to make those things very clear because I know sometimes it can feel a little cloak and daggers and that's not our intention. Um, it's just the nature of adaptive management and continuing to try to best manage this entire situation in an ongoing pandemic. So thanks. Thanks, Andrea. Um, Rob? I have nothing further to add, Jim. Thank you, Andrea. <laughs> That was very good. Perfect. Um, I, I, I don't either. Um, so with that, um, we'll move on in the agenda and go under presentations and staff reports. Um, and this is exciting because we've been talking about it, I think, for, for a while now is to, um, to, to talk about first robotics and to hear um, how that has been going in, in the pandemic. And so, Steve, I know that we are inviting people up. And so I leave it to you there, Charlene. Yes, I just, um, um, and thank you. And thanks to the, to the board for um, just taking a different look at some program during uh, a global pandemic. Um, you know, it came across where we accepted some dollars from Rotary and it had to update at Rotary about Charlene and her work. And I just think it's great. Charlene, thank you so much for, for coming and being promoted. And uh, I'm very, as a superintendent, I'm just very curious about how we do all what you do in, in this environment. I know the board is too. So I'll turn it over to you. If you need to, you can share your screen or you can just talk about your time, but thanks for joining us. Tonight. Thank you for inviting me tonight. Um, I do have something to share. So I will. Uh, Hopefully it works for you. because We'll give it a shot. How about Love that? It. Do we see an Osram T1922? We do. <laughs> sure do. With the, Wonderful. Um, with the Tin Man. I love it. Great for technology, huh? <laughs> uh, thank you again for inviting me to present this evening. My name is Charlene Betts. I'm the coach for OSRAM, a first robotics competition team comprised of 13 students from Hopkinton Middle High and John Stark Regional High Schools. Along with having won multiple awards in New Hampshire and the New England First District over the years, OSRAM has traveled to Atlanta and Detroit to do compete with teams from all over the world. We are currently in our 15th year and look, look forward to many more. Yep. A typical year involves off-season events, community outreach opportunities, donuts, and pizza. This year has had none of those. A typical competition season would start with a kickoff in early January at SNHU where the game would be revealed. The team would use the next week to thoroughly read the game manual, strategize gameplay and prototype ideas for the robot. Over the following five weeks, the team would build elements to simulate the com competition field and design, CAD, assemble, program, and test the robot. This would be followed by as much practice in operating the robot as time allowed, aka never enough. At the same time, spirit members would design game theme t-shirts, pins, and a banner for our pit at competitions. They would also update the team website and brochure with the logos of current sponsors. Osram would then attend two regional competitions with the hopes of moving on to the district championships and ultimately worlds. This season, the kickoff was virtual. Of the three challenges offered to teams, Osram opted for the challenge that uses last year's robot. While it may seem easier because it was built on last year's experience, having had a shortened season and eight members graduate in 2020, 
means that the remaining students have had lots to learn an unusual environment in which to apply that learning. After last year's competition season was cut short, the team was unable to meet in person. While not knowing what to expect in 2021, students went ahead and redesigned portions of the robot, cutting up new parts that have been fabricated and assembled onto the original base. Once known as Tin Man 15, the robot has now been dubbed Tin Man 15.2. Late summer, small robots were purchased and given to each student so that the team members could learn about programming. It gave us a focus for virtual meetings that, which helped to emulate the social aspect of the team. Each member was allowed to work at their own level of ability and interest with a few really taking to it and one student even filling the position of lead programmer this season. With schools having many days remote, it became harder for students to spend yet more time online and the number of active members waned. I anticipate that most of our members will return once regular in-person meetings resume. We have been able to meet safely in person when needed for assembly and testing of the robot and the filming of videos for the challenges. Each member attending in person completes a health screen form and has their temp temperature taken at the beginning of the meeting. Masks are required and social distancing is maintained as much as possible. We have been trying our best to keep up team spirit. One of the mentors created Osram masks for the team and it has been a great way to help us feel that we are all in it together during the pandemic. First has also worked at keeping up enthusiasm for the program by supplying teams with logo masks and shop towels. Several of the students collaborated on a team video. It includes clips of members sharing what Osram means to them and has beginning and ending animations made by one of the students. It can be found on the team's website along with lots of information about Osram. Over the fall, we also updated our brochure and created letters to send to local companies requesting their support. The response showed how fortunate we are to have generous sponsors such as our namesake, Osram Slovenia. Beyond the local support for individual teams, the first program receives funding from New Hampshire's BAE Systems, as well as NASA. For a second year, Osram, Osram qualified for the STEM grant provided by the New Hampshire Department of Education. After having spent a portion of the grant on first registration fees, the team will now look into using some of the funds to purchase equipment and supplies that will create the opportunity for students to see their design process through to the fabrication of parts using a CNC machine or 3D printer. In addition, the grant may enable the team to acquire a trailer, which would provide safer transportation of the robot, extra parts, supplies, and spirit items to competitions and community outreach events. While New Hampshire was unable to host an in-person Governor's Cup in the fall, the team competed virtually for judged awards. Several students contributed to a group interview. The students found it to be rather difficult, but presented themselves well and came away with a greater understanding of how to prepare for similar events in the future. Along with tuition funds awarded by New Hampshire at the Governor's Cup, there are many college scholarships available to students involved in the first program. This season, the first robotics competition is comprised of judged awards similar to, sim similar to typical seasons, as well as virtual at-home challenges. The judged awards include categories for excellence in engineering, industrial design, and autonomous achievement. Osram has just finished submitting two photos of the robot, a CAD drawing, a video of an autonomous routine, and a flyer highlighting aspects of the robot for the judged awards. The next step for the team is to create videos for the skills portion of the at-home challenge. These videos will show the robot completing five different courses using either autonomous control or student drivers at the helm. Along with the team awards, there is also an award given to individual first participants. Osram has nominated two students for the Dean's List Award. Good luck to Ben from Hopkinton and Logan from Ware. 
After this spring's official competition season wraps up in April, Osram will have many options of things for the team to do. These include challenges using a mini bot provided by the New England FIRST program or creating demonstration robots for community outreach. Another focus for the team will be recruiting new members. Students interested in the STEM topics of science, technology, engineering, and math, along with art, which turns them all into steam, are encouraged to join and find out what Osram and robots, and robots are all about. As we look ahead to the fall of 2021 and the competition season of 2022, the team is hopeful that in-person meetings will soon be the norm and exciting events will once again take place. While the effects of the pandemic may have felt like a tornado at times, Osram is confident that there will be a rainbow. I'd like to finish by thanking the school and community for their support for Osram and encourage everyone to visit our website. Thank you. Charlene, that was, that was great. Uh, thank you so much. And do you mind if there's any questions, will you take some? Uh, that would be fine. Perfect. So any, any members of the board have, have questions? I don't have any questions, but I did get a chance to see the robot in action at the last PTA fun fair, which wasn't last year, but the year before. And it's really astounding what these students are able to make. It, I mean, it is, it's far beyond me. Um, and it's just, it's really impressive. And I, I, I so appreciate all of your work as well. I think that this is such a benefit to so many kids. Um, so thanks for coming and presenting to us. I really appreciated it. Thank you for having me. I, Charlene, thank you for coming again. I mean, when you came to the board meeting, I think it was a, a year ago and you brought the robot. It was just very exciting to see. And uh, next time in person, I hope the kids bring it bring it again because it's it's just exciting to see that kids using their creative minds and all collaborating together. And to be able to still have this during a public health crisis, you know, thank you for leading these, these students so they have this type of engagement to, with each other. Um, thank you for all the hard work you're doing. It's Great presentation. Thank you for your time. My pleasure. I don't have any questions, Charlene. I've, I've seen this in action for a long time. Great program. I think the thing that, you know, to remind people of is that it's not just the engineering part. I was always amazed at the art and management that goes into it and kids with all different skill sets who can be a part of this program, um, even if they aren't being programmers. And, you know, it, it's really a cool group of kids that, that produce a great product and, and obviously with good leadership. Thank you. And, you know, we, we get every, you know, every couple of weeks, we, we get to approve and accept, um, you know, donations from generous um, companies and individuals. And so I, I just want to, I, I know fundraising isn't easy and it's not always fun, but um, it's wonderful to see the support from, you know, businesses across the state um, supporting your work. So congratulations on that. So we're quite fortunate in that. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We really, really do appreciate it. And it's, it's, um, it is cool. And we have been talking, um, you know, for the past couple of months about how, how on earth you're pulling off in a pandemic, the, the first robotics. So it's, it's uh, great to come and, and get a peek under the hood. So thank you. Thank you. Well, have a great night. Thank you. Charlene, if you want to stop sharing, then I can do the rest for you. I, All right. I'll, a quick story while you're doing that. Um, one of the long trips for first was to Orlando for the for the worlds, and Will Renault called and said, "Steve, we got an opportunity to see the space shuttle take off. Um, can we stay an extra time?" And I, of course, called the superintendent. And Will said, "Steve, didn't matter what your answer was, we were staying no matter what." But so and that was Will if you knew him. But uh, Charlene, thank you so much, and it was uh, absolutely wonderful to uh, have this presentation. My pleasure. Thank you all so much. Good night. Good night. And, but uh, some of the Hopkinton High School students and John Stark were at Watch the Space Shuttle in Orlando. It's pretty, That's it pretty, pretty cool. cool. Yeah, very, very cool. And this was one of our first collaborations with another school. Since then, we've done a lot. But it was a John Stark, Hopkinton, one of our first collaborations. So uh, next on the agenda for presentation is uh, we have a progress report um, with the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. And so, um, Steve, is, is that you give, walking us through that? I'm um, uh, promoting Chris. So, oh, perfect. Um, so Chris is coming up. And just as he gets settled, 
um, ready to go. I just, um, I had a chance to read it a couple of times. We talked about leadership today and Chris will highlight, but it really is a great summary of all the work we've done in the last few years, curriculum, facilities, safety and security. Um, but Chris, thank you um, for actually writing. Um, yeah, this was not your, not your first NIAS report. So you've done no. a few of them in your time, but I'll turn it over to you, but thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, so I, I don't know if you've had time to read it. It's 38 pages. Uh, it's a rather long report. It's probably the longest report I've written uh, for NEASC, um, but we had a lot to say. Um, and I guess I, I'll, I'll, I'll work backwards here. Uh, and if you take a look at the last page, if you have an, an opportunity to do so, I, I think that's the page that really speaks volumes to the amount of work that's been going on in our building um, and at a district level. Uh, one of the things we had to do with the five-year report, which we didn't have to do for the two-year, was to go through the two-year report and the five-year report and take a look at the number of recommendations we had uh, and take a look at how many were completed from two years, uh, from the two-year report through the five-year report. Um, and you can see there we had quite a large jump, um, you know, two, at the two-year report Three years ago, we had had six recommendations completed out of the 52 that came out of that report. And, and 52 can seem daunting. <laughs> I mean, I know it was for me uh, being the first time that I had gone through this as a school administrator. I had gone through it once before at Concord High School as a teacher. Um, but it, it's rather daunting when you see 52 recommendations and you're, and you're asking yourself, how are we gonna do all this work? Um, but I, but I, felt, I felt great after taking a look at uh, what we had what I had put together for the five-year report and saw that that number jumped to six uh, recommendations completed up to 21. Um, a lot of those recommendations really um, uh, revolved around the curriculum work that we've been doing, assessment and instruction, um, and also around the facilities project. And of course, there's still some work to do there. Um, and in some of the, um, in standards uh, five, six, and seven that start to address some of that facility work, um, as you have a chance to take a look at it, you'll see that it will say that it's in progress, but uh, I, I kind of um, chunked, it, chunked it out because there were, there were parts of it that had steps to it. So there's, there's some recommendations, like we're, we've completed half of the recommendation, but because it's a facilities project, not all of it's done. So we've done the roof, we've done um, the security of, of the front entrance of the building that was a part of, that was a, a piece of the recommendations that if the bond didn't pass, um, you know, what, what was the backup plan to take care of the safety and security concerns? Um, so some of that we've been able to address, but we're not done the science labs yet. So, you know, those are some things that you'll see in there that I kind of um, pieced out as saying, this was completed, but this is planned for the future because it's happening this summer. Um, so really proud of the staff with the amount of work that they've done with, uh, in regards to the curriculum. We've been, uh, this year it's been a little harder to focus on assessment um, as one of our building goals, um, but it will be one that will continue work as, as we are planning. And I very much agree with Andrea that that's my plan is to be back in full come, come August, the end of August, early September. Um, but if you continue to take a look at that table, um, you, you know, 53% in the two-year report uh, of the recommendations were still in progress. Um, that's dropped 17 points down to 35 and, and a half or 35.8. So we've made some progress there. Um, and we do have one, um, one, one recommendation that we rejected in the two-year report, and, and I've still marked that as rejected. And that, that one uh, you can find on page 17 of the report. And it has to deal with the teachers collaborating with special education and school counselors um, in, in developing a formal plan for collaboration. And the reason why we really felt like that wasn't a, a recommendation we wanted to, to work on is because we really feel that we do that very well already without a formal plan. You know, we're a very small shop, as you know, um, it's 50 steps for me to go see the building coordinator of special ed, which is Holly Sharon. Um, she's in the office. She comes to see me or Rebecca, um, or she's, you know, you can see her frequently in the, in the guidance office, speaking to school counselors, um, a lot of hallway conversations. Um, but we've also uh, implemented the school, the, the, the um, uh, specific design, a specifically designed instruction model, implemented that in the areas of en uh, English and mathematics. So we have a special education teacher in our supported 
math classes in the seventh and eighth grade level and in the high school level. Um, and we have uh, case managers working in high school English classes as well as middle school English classes. And there's a lot of collaboration that happens there as well. So we don't have a formal plan, but it is a focus of ours. So if you take a look at that table and you see, you know, or, or, or wondering, you know, what does that mean that we rejected something? Um, it's only because we feel like we're doing a, a pretty good job at it already. Um, and there's a few there that, you know, we, we haven't taken any action on um, really because of time. Uh, there were a couple that we were able to move on. Um, so, you know, that dropped a little bit for us as well. Um, and I, I think if you take a look at the end of the report, there were some interim report questions that were um, sent to me uh, over the last couple of years as we continue to update them with special products reports. There's a lot of information in there. Um, uh, it's a rather long narrative of the work that we've been doing. Um, and, and really, I, I would have to say that's like the meat and potatoes of this report. There's a lot of good information in there um, that, that highlights a lot of the good work that we've been doing from an instructional and assessment point of view, um, and also from a district point of view with our facilities. So, um, you know, it, I didn't want to go through each page and, you know, and flip through it. So it's just a lot of, um, it, it, it was a lot of work to put this together, but it was a lot of work to, to complete in order to have the right information to put together. So now we will wait. So, I mean, they're behind uh, on, on getting some of these reports read. Um, usually in the next, um, they, they meet quarterly um, to review all of these reports. So this will be in the second quarter that they'll review this. So hopefully by the end of the school year or sometime during the summer, we'll, we'll have their response to this report. But I'm happy to answer any questions if you did have a chance to to take a look at it, um, I'm happy to answer those questions. Thank you. I just would like to highlight, and, and uh, Jim remembers for all the building project presentations, the accreditation, what a different report it would have been if the community did really, really stepped up and supported the building project. So my uh, always appreciated this community because it was an easier report once that bond had passed. So um, Chris, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, Chris, thank you uh, for the report. I, I, I read, I, I read a bunch of it and skimmed the rest because it is quite in depth and um, it is a great job. Um, I, I, it's, it's not like a nothing to put something like that together. So it's very good, very full of information. Rob? In, in the support materials as well. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Uh, just congratulations, Chris. I know when that uh, those first came out, it was a lot, a lot of stuff to do. And uh, you guys are definitely plugging away. So that's terrific. I thought, you know, I just, and, and this probably was talked about at a previous board meeting, but, you know, the process to this process, I think it's important that people understand that it starts with a self-assessment and that's almost a two-year project within the school and seven different groups, uh, all looking at and ana analyzing things like, you know, assessment in the building and, you know, all these categories. And then we put that, or that report goes forward and then when the visiting team comes, they're essentially assessing that self-study uh, to sort of, you know, if you, for, you know, are you being, are you, everything you're saying accurate and both in your strengths and weaknesses. And it's, it's quite the undertaking and then the follow-up. Um, <laughs> God bless you, Chris. It's a lot of work. Yeah, and there, I'll be in, I'll be interested to find out what the next visit will be like, because I know they're talking about making some changes uh, to how the visit is uh, handled and conducted. Um, if you remember, uh, or members of our staff remember, they, they come in on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, we do a rather large presentation uh, to the visiting committee, and then they're in the classrooms, hallways, offices, uh, meeting with school board members, superintendent over the next three days before they leave. And when, when they leave, we all breathe a sigh of relief and get a lot of sleep because those three days, I, I can't tell you, I slept a lot while they were in the building. Um, but it, as, as much as sometimes I hem and haw at the fact that I have to write another NEASC report, um, it, it is a, writing this report is, is great professional development for me, um, just to go through this. One, to stop and, and realize how much work we're doing, because sometimes we get lost in the, in the weeds of everything, of everything we're trying to do. And on top of what we've had to deal with since last March, um, just gave me a great sense of pride in the work that, that our building is doing. Um, and we still have growth to do. Um, it doesn't stop here, um, but um, looking forward to starting to focus on some of these other recommendations that they uh, 
have given us and 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 making our school better. Andrew, yeah, I, Chris, this is really I I thought the nuance captured in this was really interesting. Um, I. I don't know if I enjoyed reading through it, but it was very interesting. It's it's a great long report. I was wondering too, and I'm glad that folks will be able to look through it. I was wondering if you could speak just a little bit to um, why we do, you know, why we need to do the NIESC report aside from us improving as a as a school and district. Why is this important um, that we that we do and that we stay on top of it? Sure. No, I appreciate the the question. Uh, well, NEASC is the oldest accrediting body for colleges and high schools in the country. There are several throughout the country, but NEASC, New England Association of Schools and Colleges, is the oldest. And there were seven standards that they um, uh, critique us by, uh, and some of those are within the school community and our building and our facilities and how the school community supports its schools uh, through their budget. And, um, and then the other standards really revolve around what we do every day, which is the CIA, the curriculum instruction and assessment pieces in school culture. Um, and so when we look at that process, um, we begin that with, um, I, I actually, actually Rob was one of the people, uh, one of the teachers that helped to head up um, our staff in organizing, getting ready for this, uh, this visit in this accreditation process. But we essentially had seven subcommittees. Every staff member in the building had to be on a committee. And each one of those committees headed up one of those standards. And in the first standard, it really talks about our core values and beliefs. And so uh, two years prior to the NEASC Association coming into the building, you know, we went through a revision process of our, of our CVBLE. Um, and it was a rather extensive process. Um, I think it took just over a year and then we brought it to the school board and they approved it, I think in, in June of 2015. So, um, and, and we'll look at revising that again. We'll go through it again and make sure it's still good. But it, it's important for our students in, 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 as a senior to graduate from accredited high school. There needs to be some oversight to what we're doing in our building, how our teachers are writing and delivering curriculum, how we're assessing our students, what does the culture of our building look like? Um, are we doing everything we can socially, emotionally for our students? Um, and as I said, it, it, is a, it is a daunting process, but it is a good process for us to go through because as you heard Rob say, we have to, it all starts with that self-assessment. You know, I, I, uh, if we can't look ourselves in the, in the mirror and say, okay, we're, we're really good with this, but we can improve in this area. Um, then we're not learning, you know, and we're not trying to get better and we don't practice what we preach, right? So um, if we're asking our students to work hard and learn, um, but we don't take the opportunity to stop and reflect about our own teaching and practices in the building, we're just not going to get better. Um, and in, like, for instance, one of the areas um, uh, suggestions it talked about was how do we get out to the community uh, inform them more about our core values and beliefs and learning expectations and our overarching competencies. And as I was going through this report, as I said, this is a nice thing for me to reflect upon. You know, we have a program of studies nights coming up uh, next Tuesday on March the 9th. And, you know, we'll take some time to actually walk our, our eighth grade parents through that. And then we'll look to do it again with our sixth grade. We've never done that before, but I'm going to add, because it's a natural place to put it. Um, so it, that's why it's nice for us just to go through that reflection. And that's just one example. Um, but, I, but if schools don't, uh, if they don't have their accreditation, um, it, it doesn't look good on a senior's application to colleges. And the, it, the last thing that I want to um, be involved with is a school that's not accredited as a building principal um, because I, our students work too hard to get that high school diploma uh, over 12 years and to, to get there um, without, a, without, a, without, a high, without an accredited um, or, or to graduate from a non-accredited institution uh, is not good. Um, and one of, my, one of my very good friends uh, that I went to college with, he went to Stevens High School. And at that time when he graduated in 1991, it was not accredited. And that's really where all of the state funding issues really began to come into play. And he almost did not get into college because it was not an accredited high school. And that was a state college, that wasn't a private. Um, so that, that really sits with me because never would I want any one of our students to be um, put in that position. And I don't think we ever will be. I do, I do think we have the um, support of the community. 
we, uh, you know, we, we have the support of the school board. We have hardworking staff members in our building. Um, so, it, but I, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, I was a little nervous that if we didn't get this facilities project done, where it was gonna go, because part of that facilities project was directly connected to how do we deliver our curriculum? And that's the science classrooms, that updating those science classrooms was an essential piece to this report and everything that they were looking at. And uh, it will be great that by the time they get those science rooms completed and they come back, you know, they'll only be four years old um, and everything else we've done, I'm hoping facilities is not even on or even considered as an issue because then maybe this report's only 14 pages and not 38. Um, but it's essential. I mean, it, it shows that what we're doing is good work. It's, it's being looked at by a body of our peers. It's being approved by a body of our peers. And the recommendations are good recommendations. It's good to have somebody else come in and take a look at what you're doing when they know what they, they know your business, right? So. Norm. So they come every four years is when they come, Chris? Every no, I, it's every 10 years they come. Oh, okay. It's every so, 10 years. So really what the, the, that you do a two-year uh, progress report after they um, finish their uh, their visit, and then you uh, typically do a five-year report, which you have in front of you. Um, but I we had to do uh, special progress reports because of the facilities. So there were several pro special progress reports over the last several years that that uh, I've shared with the board and uh, had to write up. But it was mainly all about facilities. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions or, or comments for Chris? And Steve, this is, you said it's in the supporting uh, documents folder. Is there anywhere else that we keep these reports so the members of the community could look at this one, even past ones, if they're interested? Yeah, that'll go to the school board under reports, meetings, okay. and pages. So we'll put it in support materials and we'll bump it up. Perfect. Thank you. Appreciate that. And Thank Andrew, there's a, there's a present, there should be a presentation on there that I made in 2016 a PowerPoint presentation, and that will uh, give you a little bit more information about each one of the standards uh, and who was on the committees then. You'll see Rob uh, was part of that, obviously. Um, so if you, if you wanna take a look at that and have any other questions, I'll be happy to to, to meet with you and answer those. No, I, I appreciate that. My question is more also for the broader community, because yep. sometimes I think we hear a lot of, we hear a lot of acronyms and we don't always know what they all mean or, or how important some of these things are. So I really appreciate your explanation. Sure. It's helpful. All right, well, thanks, Chris. Um, Welcome. Have a great night, we appreciate it. Yes, I think I'm, am I coming back? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, well, we'll keep you posted. Well, stay uh, uh, he's he's gone now. <laughs> all right, so. Uh, for those following along, we are on agenda item nine, uh, items for board discussion. And so um, we're gonna start with operating and learning in a pandemic. And Steve, I'm gonna hand it over to you, well, for most of it, but for the first two, um, a couple updates on cases and then um, the educational model at Harold Martin. Sure, thank you. Um, so what I've tried to do is every board meeting and then I follow up with an email to the community for those who don't attend. At Harold Martin School, we have five children right now in a travel quarantine and three due to an exposure quarantine, but no active cases. At Maple Street School, we have nine in the travel quarantine and two with exposures quarantine. And at the high school we had um, uh, up until today, we had just travel quarantine and we just had one today due to exposure. So um, no active cases right now in our schools, but we do have a couple that we're watching, um, waiting for some testing. And then I'll follow that up with an email to the community. Um, I'm going to the next top, next bump up is Mr. Bill Carosa. See, I like. That. Okay. So as Bill comes forward, um, so we we really do never stop trying to trying to make things better, trying to respond to to needs in, in the community. Um, a lot of what I like in this work is is really nothing is off the table. Um, we do all the leadership team just how we bounce stuff off each other. Um, and just Bill's going to talk about just some thoughts about early elementary that is an area that we've always been concerned about, even back to the August 1st, the very first presentation of back to school that I made about the concerns about early elementary. Um, Bill, I'll turn it over to you. And uh, thanks for bumping out. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. I, I'm doing okay. Sound all right, Steve? You are. You sound great. I've had some... Uh... 
wireless issues off and on. So, so thank you for having me here. Well, um, as we know, a significant portion of this year, one fact we can agree on has been remote, um, a big portion of the year. And the instructional year that hasn't been remote has been uh, the hybrid model, which you know comes out to about 50% uh, instruction. We also know, I think, that our youngest students, kindergarten and first grade students, uh, we're talking about tonight, really have probably more difficulty, certainly with remote. And of course, everybody uh, suffers a little bit from obviously not having uh, full-time instruction. So uh, I don't want to talk about catching up or kids being behind necessarily, but we just know it's common sense um, that, uh, you know, it's been a rough year and really since March, it's been a full calendar year and then it'll be uh, a little more of that as well. You know, one thing I should mention too, our youngest kids are preschool kids. The funny thing, we don't talk about it much, but uh, preschool has been normal all year uh, because their schedule is already sort of shortened. You know, kids either go two or three days generally, some, some go five, uh, but they go just mornings or afternoons. So we haven't had to adjust their schedule at all. The pandemic almost didn't happen for them uh, school-wise, not quite. We do actually have a few kids preschool remote believe it or not, um, that have you know, some conditions. And uh, Kenda and Marissa have done a great job uh, dealing with them. But anyway, tonight we're talking about kindergarten and first grade. So we've been trying to really just, it's been the theme of the year, right? Balancing uh, instruction with the need to keep everybody safe, uh, both adults and, and especially kids, as well as you know teaching social emotional learning. We'd rather not change, as Andrea talked about earlier, the six foot uh, model. We think that is best practice at this point in the pandemic. So we'd rather not go down to three or less than six. So the question would be then, uh, how could we bring more kids in, give them more instruction and still maintain the six foot um, model, six foot distancing model? So the idea, and it is mainly an idea right now that we just wanted to present to the board uh, because there is, I'll talk about, there's a lot of tricky parts to this, is we would hire an extra classroom teacher for both kindergarten and extra classroom teacher for first grade obviously just for about two and a half months. Uh, I'll let Steve talk about where that money's coming from, but uh, in this year, it's not gonna be a very long period of time, uh, obviously. So we would have to add to uh, the staff in order to do this. And what that would do is it would um, move, spread kids out among extra class. So kindergarten right now is running with three kindergarten classes. Remember one kindergarten teacher went to teach remote. So we have three classes right now. We'd add another one, so it'd be four. Um, first grade is going with four classes right now. They're a little bit bigger and they would go to five. So from three to four and from four to five kindergarten and, and first grade. Now numbers are already a little bit lower in K and one just based on, you know, generally enrollment in K and one is a little bit smaller anyway. We tend to have move-ins uh, as the years go on as people can afford uh, houses and that sort of thing, they tend to move in. Um, and so that's, you know, our original enrollment is a little bit smaller in K and one, you know, plus we've had a, you know, fairly high amount of uh, parents who chose homeschooling this year, I, I think primarily for uh, health safety reasons, uh, as well as remote, and as well as um, private school. I think for some parents who wanted, you know, full time, understandably. So it's already a bit smaller. So if we were to add the teacher in each grade, um, and everything works out perfectly, we're able to hire a couple people, we would then have class sizes around the same as the hybrid second and third grade. So it'd be around 10, 11, 12 kids uh, full time, where it, this just wouldn't work in second and third grade and, and probably up through the grades, because numbers, were, even if we added a teacher to each, you know, say second and third grade, uh, not that we necessarily could afford that, but even if we did, um, we would not really be able to uh, have class size low enough to maintain the six foot. KN1 is the exception. And we all know that KN1 is probably, as I think we've talked about a lot at, at board meetings and elsewhere, you know, that's that's where the kids have probably suffered the most during the, the remote time. Space is obviously uh, an issue, but I think we can solve that. I won't go into detail unless the board has questions about that right now, but uh, it would take some sacrifice, some creativity. Uh, I believe we can do it. I wish we could use the addition. Um, you know, if you walk out there, if you, if you don't mind uh, teaching on uh, concrete, we could probably pull it off. But no, seriously, it's not it's not ready for that quite yet. I, it looks like tomorrow it'll be ready, but it really won't be. But uh, that would be really nice. Um, placement is going to be a difficult issue. Um, so as we were talking about this, as I was talking to some of my staff and and Steve and so on, um, the easiest thing and maybe the only thing we can do is ask for volunteers. So what would have to happen is we'd have to have maybe 12 families-ish 
uh, would have to say, yep, I'm ready to go for it. I'm ready to leave my <laughs> my son's uh, class, have him leave and then join this new teacher. That's a lot to ask for, for parents, certainly, and not every parent would want to do that. Um, but we'd probably have to go over volunteers. I mean, obviously, we could talk about this. You could force families. That'd be a lot of fun. Uh, you know, call them up and say, oh, by the way, the teacher you're, you've been with all year that you love, uh, you're suddenly going to move to someone you may not know. So, you know, that's obviously placement would be an issue. Um, and we have to be aware that some kids really shouldn't be moved at all, probably. Those that maybe have the most complexity and need to, you know, stay where they are. Hiring would be something that obviously would be, you know, done very, very soon. Uh, the, the process would start very soon. No guarantee we'd find two qualified individuals, but we would advertise in-house first. There are perhaps some staff members, not classroom teachers that, that might, uh, might qualify. We would look at that and obviously go outside the district as well. So a couple of tricky parts, if it, as well as the other tricky things that I've mentioned. One is that we, we can't really get any additional kids. I mean, we, if triplets move in, that would be difficult. Uh, I don't see that happening. We generally uh, don't get a lot of new kids during this time of year, especially in K and one. Um, but I, yeah, I'm not sure homeschool families could come back at this point under this model. Private school parents and families really couldn't come back into this model. I'm not sure we can say no. That's a interesting question, but I think that would be a problem. Um, but again, as I talk to teachers and, and their reservations about this, you know, are, are a few different things, but one in particular is that they're, you know, they, they're going to have a hard time saying goodbye to kids. I mean, how do you say goodbye to a kid? I realize the bonding has been different this year, but there's still a lot of bonding in an elementary, especially kindergarten, first grade class. So, so that's, um, that's significant. The upside of this is obvious. I probably don't even have to say it. It, it increases the instruction uh, quite a bit going into the summertime, you know, two and a half months or so, uh, eliminates those home days, keeps things relatively normal uh, for K and one. I, I should mention remote learning will, will continue. The, uh, Mrs. Pepper's class, Mrs. Post class, those will not change. Uh, those are going wonderfully and those families are in a good place um, for that as well. So um, that's, that's the overview. Uh, you know, obviously we just, we want the board and the community to know we're, we're trying really hard to think about ways we can increase instruction. Um, the whole year has been tricky, so this is just the next, the next tricky idea, I suppose. So I'm sure there's questions from, from the board. Before we, we ask Bill questions, I just wonder, Steve, if you want to just touch on any of the items that Bill sort of kicked over around hiring and anything like that that you want to throw in, then we can sort of have a, have a discussion about it. Sure, and um, we do think it's, it's, it, we're talking about April 1st to the end of the year. Um, which we think we do have the funds based on the savings and based on all the wise decisions that the board made last year that we could support uh, looking at, at for two positions for about 12 weeks each. Um, so we, we do think we have, we have the funds there. Um, the, you know, we've, we've just talked about K-1 and, and what this would do, what we're looking for tonight. Um, and, and as people, like I've never um, posted a position Without and during the school year, without going to the board first, and I never thought, oh, Jim sees in the paper scheme, we've got two. Te we're looking for two teachers. What happens? So, what this is is just a permission to plan and to to advertise. It doesn't get codified. It doesn't happen until the board uh, supports the nomination, and that's when we trigger it. So, but we do look for the board's support for at least going to the next stage. And can we pull it off? Can we can we have can we find two high quality teachers? Do we get the families who? Um, really believe so much that if we did, you know, and we hear it from the community that uh, K-1, uh, full day, full time from April 1st to the end of the year will make a difference. So we think, you know, if we can pull this off with high quality teachers and somehow create some transition from, you know, the current teacher to the next and do that well, that um, the full day, all day for the rest of the school year starting around April 1st, um, we think it has great potential, and, I, and it, this is just trying to, can we, can we investigate, can we inquire, can we move to try, um, and, and we know that K-1 has been tough on those home days, and so can we do it, so, um, you know, uh, Bill is a glass half full, will try anything, he works, he, he respects his staff, they are positive and, and critical friends to make this work, I trust Bill and his team to, to whether or not this can be done with high quality, high expectations and high fulfillment. And if not, Bill will be honest and Steve, we tried, but we just can't do it. It, it wouldn't be better um, than what we've got right now. Um, but we would like to give this a shot and continue to. And 
And I know Andrea said it, Jim, and I say it, leadership, this adaptive management. We have never stopped trying. We've added 300 hours of intervention. We're full synchronous now as much as we can at the high school. Now we're looking at K-1 going full all day, every day, um, April 1st at the end of the year, you know, depending on all this stuff. So we've tried to be really responsive, proactive, and try to think outside the box to increase as much in-person education as we can right now. So I, I have a quick question. First off, this is great. Like, I think a lot of parents are just smiling right now. You know, I think a, a lot of weight's off their shoulders. This is just great to hear. But the, the first thing I just want to ask you, do you foresee there being a busing issue? You know, we're kind of having this, um, you know, spaced out on the bus. Do you, do you see that being an issue with an impact of uh, more students coming in for kindergarten and first? It's potentially an issue. Um, I could say right now, and I haven't done a recent check, but the numbers of kids being bused is really low right now. Um, not just because of safety reasons, I think convenience. Um, you know, busing in this town for elementary kids has always been problematic because, um, you know, it's such a big town and, and sometimes their rides are an hour, often either down or back. So uh, we would certainly check into that and, and get uh, you know, commitments from parents and whether you're taking the bus or not. But I don't think so, Norm, but I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's being added to my list of interesting things to check out, certainly. Great question. Thank you, Norm. Yeah. I'll dive on the uh, location, location, location piece. Um, so, what, sure. so can you talk about the space? And, sure. And, no, I'd be glad to. Um, so uh, right now, um, Meredith Post is teaching from home. She's one of the remote. She's a second and third grade uh, remote teacher. Um, we do have uh, four interventionists using her room right now. Um, we would uh, we would displace them. Uh, I have talked to them, and they we have a number of of they mainly work one on one, so they don't need a lot of space. Um, a couple of them could use the computer lab, which we haven't been using a lot anyway because of COVID, honestly. Um, so we might you know put them there. There's other sort of nooks and crannies. I mean, this is where the sacrifice comes in. Uh, we'd make sure they'd be in a well-ventilated place. That's something that we're, we're sure of now. The other, uh, that would be for uh, probably first grade would go in there. The other spot would be uh, Mrs. Pepper's room. And, and this is a little bit of a sad story because I've already displaced her once. Uh, now she's a remote teacher. She doesn't necessarily need, she doesn't really need the full space of her normal classroom. Um, but, you know, her materials are there. She's, I, gosh, this must be, would be the third time I think I've, I've moved her for different reasons. So I feel bad about that, but um, you know, we can, I mean, she could either do it from home or we can find a place. She really wanted to teach from school. You know, um, she didn't have the health, you know, any health reasons not to be in the building. Um, she just, you know, like me, she likes being around people. So uh, we'll find a spot for her. So those are probably the, uh, the two spots I'm thinking, Rob. Thank you, Bill. Sure. So I think what we're being asked, actually, what we are being asked, and I have to think about it, is we're being asked if, if we can, if, if the board feels comfortable giving the sort of go ahead um, to do next steps to, to put, you know, I think job descriptions out on the street and, and see where we get to. And so that this is really a temperature taking to see where the board's at on this proposal. Um, I saw Norm gave a thumbs up. I don't know if anybody else has concerns or you know anything you want to air. Do you, if, if people are comfortable, um, we we can give them the, the thumbs up to sort of proceed. Um, I think it's a great thing to try and pursue. If you can make it happen, all the better. So, thanks, Rob. Thanks, Norm. Yeah, you no, know, I I agree. I you know I I think being able to bring more and more kids back is really what we've been trying to do all year. And so I appreciate you know that we're looking at at different ideas. Um, so oh, I'm, I'm a hundred percent. Yes. Let's, let's do what we can to see if we can bring kids back. Yeah. And I'm, I'm all in, I think it's, it's, it's great. I pre really appreciate, you know, Bill and Steve, you guys working on this. I guess my only question is, um, uh, and, and it's probably, I don't know if you thought of this, but when do you do sort of the, the reach out to parents? Um, cause you, you have the hiring, which is an important step, obviously, but then there's also I mean, you need to have the kids in the classrooms in order to make it work. And so I'm just wondering where, when in the process do you, do you need to do the outreach to parents to sort of see if you can fill the classrooms with, you know, willing volunteers, as you put it, um, to see if it all kind of works together. I would say, I don't, you know, I haven't thought exactly about that, but it, off the top of my head, I would say within the next couple of weeks, 
Um, you know, March is the big month uh, if this is going to work. Um, we may also need to look at, and this I did not mention this to Steve, so this is uh, making sausage live, as we'd like to say. Um, I think if, if we're going to go down this road, those teachers would need, a, I think, a full day to get ready, uh, if nothing else, well, not if nothing else, but one of the many things, just even moving desks in and things, things like that. So, um, you know, I, the flexibility needed in this is, is pretty big. So I think we need to uh, make sure teachers have the support they need. And, um, you know, we'd, Bill would come back, we'd start working on this and Bill would come back, and, you know, obviously back on the 18th, two weeks from now, to see where we are with a hope of an April one, I don't know if that's a Monday, but you know, the, a Monday near April one, is to, to see where we're at, but we'll give an update in two weeks at the eight, at the 18th and see where we're at, but we'll begin planning. It sounds like, Bill, we've got at least uh, the next step to, to do the best we can and, and figure it out and see if it works, but it, it may not, but I, hey, it, everything's worth a, a try, so I appreciate you and your team. You bet. Thank you. Yeah, very much. Good luck. Um, fingers crossed. It's, it's, a, it's a great idea. Thanks. Um, so, Bill, we're going to um, demote you, my friend. And no uh, stick, stick around, you never know. Have a good night, Bill. Uh, all right, um, so up next is a, uh, a conversation around spring sports. Before we go there, can I ask Steve something real quick? Oh, I just want to, no, I just want to stay on the same. Um, so I, I fully support what Andrew said at the beginning, you know, and, and I fully believe what we're doing right now with six feet is appropriate for the school. But um, one thing, you know, I, I did mention to Steve in passing the other day was um, what the school district would, would look like um, at three feet. And the reason I'm asking, um, asking for this is because um, a lot of things can change in the next month. And I think it's very, you know, as a school board member for me, who knows what's going to happen in the next week. Things are changing with vaccinations and all that. And, and, and just for me to be able to see the data of what this district would look like, I, I'd be very interested in. And I'm not advocating for three feet. I want to make that very clear to this board. Um, you know, in discussions with this community, I have clearly told them that it is not possible to get all our students in. And they've said, well, show me the proof. And I said, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not the guy who's in charge of the district. Um, and I don't, I don't know what the step is to show them that, you know, through K, through K through 12, that, you know, the fifth grade would only have this many students in while you have a remainder of seven students. And then those seven students are left out based on space. How hard is it, Steve, to be able to, to just show that data? Because who knows what's gonna happen week to week um, with you know, the CDC or whatever changes. Is it a lot of work to say, hey, this is what it would look like in a, in a snapshot based on a three feet? Again, I'm not advocating for it. I'm just collecting it, data as missing pieces, kind of. I mean, it, it's some work because each, like at the elementary, it's a little bit different. We have more uniform class sizes, but at the secondary level, we we go from 13 to 24 and it, you know, rooms change, but it can be done if, if you're looking at how many classes could be all in with the three feet, if, if that's what norm you're looking for. Um, so, um, but you know, some classes, at the, at the secondary level, as Rob's talked about, right, we have trapezoidal yeah. tables. Um, so that really does limit, right, because we don't, we, we really do, don't like the single desk, you know, and we like the collaborative, but I mean, we can, we can look at it, um, and we'll certainly dig in as much as you would like, um, but it's, it's different levels of work, and in some are barriers of furniture, and really, um, some are barriers of 24 kids, you know, um, yeah. but well, our job it, is to provide you with the information. I also think, I mean, it, it, just thinking what you said, Steve, there's also, you know, there's the classroom space, but then there's all the other spaces within the school building. And so I, again, how, I don't want to, I mean, I don't know if Steve can do that, but how you start to space out cafeteria spaces and, and line space. And, and buses, you know, right? Buses. Yeah, I mean, so there's, yeah. a, the, the, the becomes, it, it becomes, a, it, it just becomes a larger puzzle to, to put together. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I hope you guys understand what I'm just trying to think, you know, outside the box, you know, I mean, I know it's a lot of work. I'm going to, you know, I'm just having a conversation, just, um, you know, something changes. We have information ready, already assessed that saying, you know, if we have seven students out of sixth grade, you know, and, and things change in April, you know, maybe we'll look at outdoor classes for those individuals. So I, I was just something um, I was thinking about um, because it may get to the point where how do we decide what kids are going in? Yeah. If seven if seven kids aren't able to go, if we decide to go at three feet, so 
um, the discussion for me was more or less just, just you know, to, the discussions I've had in the community and just in general saying that it's just not possible that, you know, and to be able to share with them saying that the puzzle is not that easy. So it was. Yeah. Just, you know, having been in many of those rooms, I think the simplest mm -hmm. way to do it is ask every classroom teacher, can you fit all of your kids? If you've got a class of 26, can you fit them all in here at three feet? I can tell you right now, there are certain rooms that I taught in that there's no way you can do it. Um, but they could quantify that very easily. Um, so, you know. And I appreciate that. It was probably easy. Rob, I think you're right. It's probably easy way to do it is that the teachers know the kids in their classroom and they know their classroom. Because there's there's that moving target of you know you got a class of 17, but then you might have a class of 26, so and that changes things dramatically. And it just gives a snapshot. Nothing. Oh, we'll, look, we'll look at it. Okay, I I, re, I appreciate. It. And again, I'm not advocating for it. I want to make it clear. I support what Andrea said. What we're doing as a board, um, just future discussions. You know, if things change in our in our world, whatever. You know, it's there. Um, it is what it is. Thank you guys. All right, so next up on the agenda is the uh, interscholastic sports and spring sports. So Steve, and, um, hand, hand and Dan and Chris are available, but I, I we can start out with just me. And if you have questions, we can bump them. Um, just uh, deep appreciation and, and, and respect to Dan and his team. We've had, and I'm successful, I'm not talking wins or, wins or losses successful or tournament successful, successful in um, you know, maintaining healthy kids in a, in a, in a safe program in which we've gone. Um, you know, I think they're looking at, oh, you know, 12, 14, 15 games, whether it's middle school, JV. So it was, a, it was we're in a very good place. Um, so next, believe it or not, we're back in spring. We're, we're almost at, at spring. And so and if we go back to the fall um, where we were, um, and it's very similar approach, it would be masks, it would be um, regional cohorts. Um, if we do use the gym and inclement weather, it would be very few number of kids. Our, our most coaches like to be out full time once we start. We're talking um, limited start last week of March, full start first week in April. Part of that is weather that we can get everybody out. Um, but we would, um, and tonight it's, it, it, it gets codified by the nomination of the spring coaches. And, um, but it's a very similar model. And as Norm asked earlier, we can certainly provide a memo, but it is the, it is the screenings. It is the uh, masks. It is the regional cohort. Um, it is strong communication. Um, in our programs, and and we'd like to um, begin uh, the next stage of looking at spring. I can't believe that the spring is here. Steve, can you just remind me what what are our spring sports? Sure, we're um, baseball, softball, um, lacrosse, um, spring track, um, and, and, and I think those baseball, softball, spring track, uh, boys, girls, lacrosse. If I missed any, I'm going to be really embarrassed to say no if I missed any. So all outdoor sports, um, perfect. Nice. And, uh, and Dan wrote, and, and to me, I hope I included, if we, um, that's one of the reasons why we want to put it out. We don't want 20 kids in the gym. You know, 30 kids, we don't want the entire track. So um, we'll put it off and, and very few will be in the gym. A little bit of, you know, they do want to do some arms work, right? You know, because it's been a long winter for throwing, for safety, but it'd be small kids. It's just a few in the gym. And just connected um, as we come to the end of the season um, and we are more in school and I had a chance, I was over at the high school this week and I saw the kids eating lunch in the gym and, and, and then spread out things. Um, we, we would like to at least be able to, if the numbers working with Amy, Dan, Chris and I, if the numbers are right in the, in the next week or two to support just two members of each family supporting the end of season awards in the gym, you know, we can spread the gym out like crazy, you know, for it and, um, we would just like to at least provide the opportunity, if, if the numbers are good, where Amy, uh, Chris, Dan, and I are to allow two people to just to enjoy the, the award ceremony at the end of the season. If, that's, if that works, we have the authority to do it if we think it's safe. And Steve, you had mentioned that, that would, it would be not all the sports would be on the same night. It would sort of be spread out, so it would be on multiple nights. Yeah, that's what Dan's looking at, at least two, if not more nights. Um, I don't want to commit him to nights, but we're talking about a, a basketball night or a, you know, a Nordic and ski night. And then if there's, you know, hockey you usually do something with John Stark. But yeah, certainly spreading them out that it wouldn't be two people for the entire program. Uh, um, and and it's, if, if Dan can design it and working with his coaches, make sure the coaches are comfortable too. And then having Amy and I and Chris and Dan just looking at numbers and see where we are, if we feel it's okay and safe to have 
a very, very social distance opportunity to honor and appreciate what all the coaches have done and what the teams have done. Any thoughts from the board on that? I wonder if we can, um, for those nights, I don't know if it's a specific night that the award ceremony usually falls on, but perhaps we could do it maybe on like a Friday night so that there's not school the next day if we wanted to give like a weekend for cleaning, if that feels important. Thanks. But I, I assume that you'll be underneath the max number of, like, like according to our, our um, measures, the max number of people within the gym. Them. Yes, and we're going to televise it. We're going to televise it. I don't know if that's the right word, but we're going to stream it. I think. See, I went back to the '50s or something. We're going to stream it. Um, so, because some people just aren't comfortable, right? And, they, and, and some people who, you know, grandparents in Ohio are watching their kids play sports this year, which is really nice through this to the stream. So, the awards would be streamed if people outside of our little area want to watch, or it's safe. Uh, maybe should add any objection. To this proposal and moving it forward all right and Thanks, the sports Steve. are okay we're going to nominate that in schedule b yes perfect and so next up is uh a permission to plan um for the for this for the prom so i'm going to bump up chris i'm going to bump up trish and francine and maybe some others so you're going to have to give me a sec promote ah i hate when they bounce around Ah, uh, you know what they did? They raised their hand. They're messing with me, Mr. O'Brien. You're doing a great job. You're you're promoting and demoting like a pro today. And then um And Trish, is that everybody? Chris, is that, I've got three up. Um, yes, that's everybody. That's all you need to have up. And Francie's going to share her screen. She's the one doing the presentation. Well, Francie well, is our junior well. class president. Well, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. I'm going to mute now, Francie. Girl, you're up. <laughs> all right. Let me share. Thanks for coming, Francie. I appreciate it. Nice to see you. Oh, thank you for having me. Okay, is that working? It sure is. Yep, there we go. Okay. Um, so basically, we just wanted, or we had some, we were trying to figure out prom and just reserve a venue and stuff. And so we just had questions and so, or basically, we wanted to get permission to like go ahead with it. Francie, you'll want to go ahead and talk a little bit. I know I said don't don't read it all, but you'll want to talk a little. What? You'll want to talk a little bit. Tell them about what we had planned. Oh yeah. Um. So we, yes, we reserved this, but um, the capacity is only seventy people, which is not enough for, or that would just be a really small prom. And we talked to them and they said they couldn't have an outside space because of just mud and they don't really have a place to have it. Um, which meant Pat's Peak is sort of off the table for us. But so we found the barn at Bull Meadow, which is also Oh, Francie, I don't know if we lost your audio because it looked like you were still talking, but we couldn't hear anything. It has enough room for 180 people to have a sit down dinner without COVID. So with COVID, that would be 110 people and we wouldn't be having a sit down dinner, meaning that with the New Hampshire guidelines, that's 250 people. We would keep it to 100 people who are masked inside. So we would be at less than half of the New Hampshire, like half of the maximum 
people allowed by New Hampshire COVID guidelines, which would give a lot of space for every person and allow for a lot of social distancing. Um, it also has, as you can sort of see in the lower picture, a big patio that would also have a tent. So if it's raining or it's bad weather, we can still go outside onto the patio and that would allow even more people to be out there and spread out. So we could sort of rotate people to through so we wouldn't have to, so we could have more than 100 people come and still maintain the social distancing and keep a safe distance. And so our proposed date is June Sunday, June 6, from 7 to 10. And we know it's a Sunday, but that is the only date that they have available that also works with our school schedule. And we think that most parents would be okay with that for this year, just because there's a lot going on. Um, so here's inside the barn. Um, as you can see, there's a huge, it's big. They're super high ceilings, like there's a lot of ventilation, a lot of space to spread out. Um, so we would have no tables. Francie, I don't know if you can hear us, but I don't think we can hear you. They have like little suites because it's for people who are getting married. Um, it's for weddings um, and those would be closed to promote even more social distancing and less clustering in small spaces. And we could have the windows open. So that's another bonus. Um, so outside there's, like I said before, there's a patio. So we could extend dancing and everything, dancing and talking and everything could extend out there. And it has three propane fire pits. So even if it was cold, that would still be okay because there'd be the tent and then the fire pits for bad weather. Um, and then there's also, as you can see on the lower left, there's this area, which would, it's a meadow and then the little structure, which would be perfect for If Francie cuts out, cuts out, I can keep talking. Oh, so frustrating. Mm -hmm. We've talked about having um, d games outside like cornhole or, I mean, this is, these are not typical prom activities. Um, ladder ball, uh, maybe they could set up a croquet or something like that, but things that kids could do. Um, I don't know if Francie, can hear me. Francie, can you hear us? I can. Okay, you keep talking. Now I hear you. Oh, okay. Um, so food, drinks. So obviously we would not have a sit-down dinner. Um, that's just, yeah, we would, that's, no. <laughs> um, but so as you can see in the left picture, there's a little window to the far right closest to the fence. And that's a serving window from inside. So we were thinking that we could serve little cheese and cracker boxes or individually wrapped desserts or soda and water could be served from inside to outside. So that all eating would take and all eating and drinking would have to take place outside and would only be small individually wrapped containers. And other than when you're actively eating, there'd be no removing your mask at all. So that would, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> that would help ensure more. So other than when you are eating, you would have to wear a mask and eating would have to be outside and spread out. Um, and then once again, we have the games in the meadow. Here's another picture. Okay, so we have, here are the questions that we sort of have. Um, so basically, would this be approved?
Is she still trying to talk? No, I think she's looking for letting you read and, and let you answer. Trish, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Have you compared um, what's been proposed here to kind of what other districts are doing for the prom? You know, kind of. I'm going to toss that one to Chris because Chris okay. has talked to people, but my understanding is there aren't a lot of districts considering proms. So, right, uh, yeah. So in my in my weekly uh, principal meetings, um, it's a discussion that's just starting to fire up. Um, there were about seven or eight schools that responded. Um, there are a few schools that there's been no decision made um, and they're struggling because of the size of their school. So like Portsmouth would have over 200 kids. So they're, they're trying to figure out if there's a venue that they could do something outdoors. Um, Sanborn and Keene, there's still no decision there. Conval, you know, if you remember uh, from, the, from the fall, they have a ton of tents so <laughs> already. So they may do something right at their school outside. Uh, Pinkerton did cancel their senior prom, uh, but because of the size of their school, they do a, 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 a two separate prom, proms, one for the juniors, one for the seniors, but they did cancel the senior prom. That actually happened yesterday. Um, Kearsage is looking to, uh, for an outdoor venue um, like us, or like is being proposed tonight. No dinner would be supported there. Um, and they would look to have multiple dance floors. Uh, Hollis Brookline uh, is looking at an outdoor venue. West High School just booked McIntyre Ski Area, again, an outdoor venue. Um, and then next week, we'll have another principals meeting and this will be one of the top topics on the agenda that we'll discuss. So I'll actually have, a, a, hopefully, a, more information. I did share um, the, much of this information uh, with the principals group, um, uh, with with the amount of planning that's already gone into this, so that Francine and, and others have put into this, um, we're quite a ways ahead of everybody else. So, um, you know, I, I'm proud of the, what the kids have done as far as taking a look at, you know, where can we do this, how can we do it safely, understanding that things would look different, um, and. Uh, the, there was a Friday event, just in full transparency. It was a Friday opportunity, uh, but that would have been Friday, the June 4th. Um, but on the on Saturday, June 5th, are our quarterfinals. Um, so we have the potential of all, any of our teams being in the quarterfinals. Um, so th that wouldn't be great to do the prom the night before quarterfinals. Um, so um, that's why we moved to a, a Sunday date and just ending it earlier that night. Um, so people get home at a decent hour. We are competing with all the people who had weddings put off. Um, these are very similar venues and that we have an opportunity to have a venue that's a, a big indoor outdoor venue is pretty remarkable. I, I think we're not, Pat's Peak wouldn't, wouldn't, wasn't able to do it. I think our, our plan B would be, you know, a tent at the high school or at Camp Methodius or something. Let's say, let's say you um, you plan, and something changes where this board would say no because you know we didn't like the plan, but we give an opportunity to plan. What is the financial risk that these? And because I know they they really do a lot of fundraising, I know there's a lot of money, but what, what is the financial risk of them losing if something changed that this board didn't increase the plan? So this class has raised about um, I think forty five hundred dollars. Their um, freshman and junior or freshman and sophomore years. We haven't had, um, actually, we, no, that was the other class. Um, we haven't had any fundraisers this year. We're planning to do one in May. Um, and we have $1,500 encumbered at Pat's Peak and they're being incredibly gracious and in giving it back to us. Um, we actually sign, uh, when you sign up for a venue, you sign a non-refundable. So Pat's Peak is being incredibly gracious to give it back. Um, this is a much, 
less expensive venue because we don't need to pay for their food. They are not a food venue. They employ, you know, you can hire caterers with them and pay caterers. Um, so it would be losing whatever deposit we put down. We need to put a deposit down in the next five days. Um, and the, the venue is almost, it's between $1,800 and $2,300. And we would put half of that down. So it would be about a thousand dollar loss to the to the class, and that's not school money. That's the money the kids have earned through selling hot dogs at homecoming and basketball games and selling wreaths or flowers or whatever. What about the transportation piece? In the last, I can't remember how many years, kids have gone to the prom on buses and not in their own cars. Have you thought about we that? Chris and I have talked about that and, um, and the kids and actually Francie and the kids on the prom committee and I talked, um, we would do school buses if that's what Chris and the board want. Um, and, and we've toyed with the idea of allowing kids to drive, but uh, I think Chris would prefer that we have buses, but they've said we don't need the fancy coach buses to go from Hopkinton High School to um, Bog Road and okay. it's right near Fisherville. It's like two minutes from Chris's house. Chris likes this venue because he can be home by 10, 15. <laughs> be more like 10, 30. So it's so much experience. You, that's experience talking right there. Exactly. I mean, we, we threw out the buses. One of the things I thought of afterwards, and I actually was brought up tonight in regards to Bill's proposal is, you know, the spacing on the buses. Um, so I, you know, again, we, we, I think what I said to Trish, I said that to me, figuring out transportation, I think comes, comes a little bit later down the line. Let's see, let's take the temperature of the board, let Francine go through her presentation, answer any questions that they have, and then that becomes part of our planning process. If the, if the board uh, doesn't want us to entertain the buses and have the kids drive themselves, then, then that's what we'll discuss. What I'm looking, what I'm really looking to do is, and I'm hope, I'm hoping that because of vaccinations coming out um, to, to give the students an opportunity to do something that is school-like that we just haven't been able to do since March 13th last year. I'm not even trying to ask this question. Oh, sorry, Rob, go ahead. That, that's okay. Um, if this weren't a school event, uh, and we were just talking about meeting the directives from the state of New Hampshire for a restaurant or any other public place, would we be meeting them with that number of people going? We'd be meeting them by, um, we're, we're proposing half what this venue could, this venue currently would do. If it was a standing room, so no sit down dinner, they would be allowed to have 250 people inside in this event, no food served we're talking a hundred people and then trying to keep 50 people outside. So making sure that we have kids in both spaces. How about the, um, and I, this is the question because I know the, the, the dancing piece, like how, because you know, how do you do the separation six feet allow for dancing, but then ensure, you know, as, as chaperones or as students that you are, dancing with your date and not someone else's date? So I have two, um, two ideas. One is I would very much like the kids to consider hiring a DJ who will teach line dancing and try to teach them the Macarena and Cotton Eye Joe and all of those things that would let kids dance in lines um, more than in couples. Um, I guess the, the not cynic, but the realist in me knows that these kids, if they're dating or going to prom, they're in each other's bubbles. I, I see their Instagrams, these kids are. Um, Amy Cook, our school nurse said that for, that for a reasonable price, we could probably buy 300 COVID tests and we could test ourselves on Thursday, ask the kids to quarantine until Sunday, test them again Sunday and go into it with a pretty high degree of confidence, even though they'll still all wear masks and we try to keep distance, but we could go in with pretty high degree of confidence that they, um, that we don't have anyone with the, with the virus. And we're willing to do that. Um, Francie, you can chime in, but I'm pretty sure the kids would, to have a prom, they would, 
they would do this. They would do what we ask of them. I, I really, I appreciate this presentation. I think the other sticking point for me or thing that I'm looking at is the protocol for guests from outside the district because with other things that's um, been a sticking point for us as well, like with, with sports and whatnot. Um, so how, I mean, does that, how does that factor in, I guess, is the question. Chris, do you want to weigh in? I'm, I'm pretty sure the kids would love to be able to uh, invite a date from outside of the district. Um, but I think that they also recognize that this may have to be a uh, only Hopkinton kids. Chris, do you want, I'll let you jump into. Well, and from what I understand right now, um, I think we're Brady, uh, Bishop Brady and Hopkinton were the only two schools that were talking about uh, whether or not to allow guests. Every, every other school in full transparency that, you know, I've mentioned tonight and I'll, we'll hear more next week, uh, we're saying no guests. Um, but as we continue to talk about that, that's where the idea of the test were, were coming up. Um, and, you know, and it, there are other questions, right? I mean, we're allowing, you know, we allow, you know, hockey players and basketball players to run up and down the court and bump into one another, no masks. You know, here we're gonna, you know, here they would continue to, to, to wear masks. Um, and, I, and I think the, the prom committee is doing everything they, they can to kind of embrace that with the theme that they're trying to work with, with which is more of a masquerade kind of ball. Uh, theme, um, but but again, I mean, if if we need to purchase tests, then we'll purchase tests and test our students. If we can only do our students, then we can only do our students. Um, I think our students are being um, also understand that it, if they if they get a prom and there, but there are things that we have to go without. We have a prom though, you know, and. Um, and, and we'll move that forward. And that would, you know, and, and if we need to limit the number of tickets, then we'll limit the number of tickets. Um, usually we will sell out anywhere between 140 to 150 tickets um, to a prom. Um, but if we need to limit that, then we'll limit that. I think, I think, I think we typically always sell out. Chris, is it, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna share my age here, but is it usually the junior or the seniors prom? The, the junior class puts the prom together. So it's the junior prom, but seniors go to the prom. And it's just, just juniors and seniors allowed? Or could the junior invite the sophomore? You know yeah, I mean? if, a, it... if a junior or senior was to invite an underclassman, we have, we've had freshmen and sophomores go to the prom. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. What's, um, and I don't remember right from the school calendar, like what's, when's, what's the last day of school currently scheduled in June? And I guess, and I know it's different for seniors as well. Just curious. Well, the it was the 18th because that's the night of graduation. Um, but we've had we one or two snow days now. I can't remember. So two we're going. Into, yeah, two. So we're going on the Monday and Tuesday after the 18th. Okay. Seniors would have their finals on the 13th, right, Chris? 13th, 14th of June. And then their graduation rehearsals and things that week. Yeah, it's all that week. Okay. Do you guys have a sense of how many people would be willing to attend? Has there been any kind of survey taken um, as far as how many? I know you've said in the past it's 140 to 150 tickets sold. Um, and I just didn't know if that seemed to be tracking this year, if it would be less. So Juliet, Mia, or um, Francie can chime in, but my um, sense from my senior elective is that they would be thrilled to come. And my sense from how close they are in the halls is that they don't care about how close they need to be. Um, you know, that there's not gonna be a concern on their part. I don't know about their parents. Any of you students wanna jump in? Everybody I've talked to has been super enthusiastic about it, even with restrictions. Yeah, same with me. I think people are just excited that there's going to be something. Or not that there's going to be, but that at the like that. <laughs> that there could it. be, sweetheart. We got it. No, you did great. You did great. So if there's seemingly a lot of folks who want to go, if 
the, I mean, how would you deal with limited tickets then? I, I mean, would it be a senior first thing? Would it be a, I mean, who's gets, who gets to say no to kids who want to go, but we only have a hundred tickets. That's a great question. Chris, do you have an idea? I'm sort of thinking first come first serve, like you put them on sale, but I don't know how Chris feels. Well, yeah, I mean, I think you'd, you'd probably have to do it as a first come first serve. It's the, it, you know, you're it's typically it's a junior class, but we lost a prom last year. Um, so the seniors last year were not able to attend a prom um, unless they were as a freshman sophomore invited to go. I think you'd like to make sure all the juniors and seniors can go before you expand it to a freshman and sophomore. They're going to have more opportunities to go if that means someone doesn't have a you know, the, the perfect date that night. We can talk more about that, but this is the juniors and you know seniors last shots. And right. I kind of feel like we could maybe, um, the prom committee and the seniors are the first to buy. And then after that, you open it to the juniors. I don't know. I think we certainly could develop protocol with the kids and with Mr. Kelly and Ms. Gagnon and decide what needs to happen. We, we will certainly try to make it fairest to those who would never have it, who won't have another chance to go to prom. Can you just, Francie, can you go back to the slide that's got the uh, the dimensions of the place and all that those parameters on it? This one? Yeah, that's the one. Thank you. You're welcome. The the barn is sixty by sixty, and the and it's a full two and a half stories high in the middle part of it. If you look at the bottom picture on what Francie's showing half of the patio gets covered by a 30 by 30 tent. We would not put the sides on it because once you put the sides on, it's, ca it's counted as indoor space, um, but we would just have it in case it was drizzly or cold. And then the other half of that patio is where they set up the propane tank, uh, propane heaters. And then there's a lot of grounds the kids can wander. They can bring an umbrella and a raincoat. I'm gonna tell them wear flip-flops, not high heels. Um, what was the reasoning behind choosing a hundred people um, for the inside space? It, were the NH COVID guidelines, is that less than six feet and is a hundred at six feet? Or? Francie and Mrs. Sable and I, when we were there, just thought if they can stand up um, 250 people, if we made it less than half of that we would have a better chance of, of being able to do it. And honestly, with 150 people, I'd feel personally as one of the chaperones in charge, I'd feel better with 50 of them outside and 100 of them in. I'd like to keep a third of the kids out and I'd like to keep everybody moving all night long, sort of taking turns, be in, be out. Francie, what did, you, did I capture us right? Yes, I think just, just making it even safer what would be the feeling from the class if i'm just talking out loud here if the school board said we limit to just hopkinton any of you kids want to weigh in i mean i think people would accept it i mean obviously i think we'd all prefer to be able to ask people from outside i don't know how many people actually would but people who are dating from outside the school and stuff, but I think people would be willing to accept it. Yeah, I would understand it. Um, I don't know how different it is to bring an outside guest than it is like with what's been going on with sports, but I understand like capacity is tough. So I think people would get it. Could you do something like, um... If, if the maximum capacity isn't filled, then people can, but up until that point, it's just um, Hopkinton? Or is it more of an issue of actually having people from outside? Norm, uh, you asked the question, so I don't know if you want to answer. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, it's a good question. You know, I think, you know, one of the concerns is, you know, from various communities, you know, what we're controlling, you know, within our schools, you know, we've, um, you know, I think you bring up a good point that if these, if these individuals are seeing each other outside of school, they already have that interaction. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm trying to throw some things out there to, to, kind of, to kind of think outside, but I'm really 
happy to hear that you guys are open to alternative possibilities. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I, I understand what you're asking. I just can't put the right words right now. For me, Norm, it's um, it's the issue of we've been pretty we've been pretty controlled in Hopkinton about what we do and don't allow our kids to do in our school. And I just I know our kids, and I know I know who I can say what to. I know who to expect certain behavior from, and I know who has been safe. You know, and I so for me, that's the the benefit of knowing who's in that barn with, with me and these other adults is that I know our kids. Chris and Rebecca know our kids. Thank you. Hey, to that point, Trish, how, so how many um, chaperones are there? Cause so we'll have, you know, potentially a hundred, 150 kids, but then an additional, how many ad adults? So I, I envision we need to have a police officer always. Um, Chris, you can weigh into, I envision um, making sure that there's a couple of people outside, that there's a person always at the door, making sure that what's inside and what's outside is sort of evenly distributed or the two thirds, one third distributed, and then probably four or five people inside to make sure that we're swinging through the bathrooms and making sure there's some space. So I would think eight, Chris, would you think eight or 10 people, 10 adults for that, 10 max. Yeah, and, and we may want a few more, um, you know, simply because, we, you know, there's a little bit more policing that we have to do, um, as Trish just described, you know, because usually, you know, I'll, I'll and, you know, Miss Gagnon is there as well. I mean, we also then patrol the grounds, if you will, you know, take a walk around. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if we need more people, we'll get more people. And, and knowing the staff, I mean, I, I think the staff would step up to support it because you know they're there for the kids um really quickly i have to go on a full minute so i just want to make a few comments um firstly it seems as though i had originally thought that um there would only be 100 people able to go but um i'm seeing it as 150 people would be allowed just 50 outside and 100 inside is that correct yes that's correct Okay, then that seems pretty similar to the normal amount of people that yeah. would go, which makes capacity seem like less of an issue. And then also in terms of people from other schools, I'm guessing that if anyone is dating someone from another school, they're going to be seeing each other anyways. Um, and also we are allowing indoor sports, which is people within six feet of one another, more than just two people within six feet of one another. Um, and they probably don't see each other on a regular basis as okay. it. So I just, I don't know. Good point. And we are asking our student athletes to quarantine. And so there is, so there is a little bit of a difference. Um, I, I, I understand the point. Um, so it is, it is a little different. I guess for me, um, I'm not opposed, but I've learned in the last year that I oftentimes prefer a little time to think. Um, and I really wish that you had to put your deposit down two weeks time after our next board meeting and we could make a decision then. Um, I'm just really uncomfortable saying yes. And then, you know, I get, yeah, I'm, I'm just I'd like a little time to process. I can yeah. certainly speak to the owner of the barn um, and we can we can see they, she does have, you know, I mean, dates are going quickly with them, obviously. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just sort of where Rob is. Like, I, I want to get to yes. And I, I, yeah, I think the plan that you laid out is good. And it's a good, I think it's a good starting point for us. Um, so, so can, so can I broker this, Jim? I don't mean to cut no, you off. Please cut me off. If, if Trish goes ahead and calls um, her contact at the barn, you know, this, this, this sim, you know, we're taking the similar approach to like an overnight trip. You know, we get the permission to plan and then we come back and get final permission. So if, if, if Trish is successful with her contacts and, and just letting her know that we'll have, you know, we're, we're still moving forward with our planning. The board would like some more time to consider the proposal and you give us more time to plan because that's what we're asking for here is planning um, and, and, and help us with where 
that if it was to happen, if we were to move forward, are you comfortable with outside guests or not? And, you know, and, and give us some direction on some of the questions that the prom committee has put together for the board for consideration. We can work on that over the next two weeks and then come back um, at the end of this month and, and have a follow up. You just have to where... check about the deposit. Will the barn give us an extension to two weeks for the deposit? I can ask if they will give us that extension and if they won't, I personally, um, boy, I'm, I'm then between two things. One is that we put down the deposit and we lose it if, if we say no. And the other option is that we hope the date doesn't fill and we go ahead in two weeks after your next meeting and hope that that date has not filled. Who knows, maybe we'll have the first Wednesday night prom in history. We've had some funky dates before, Trista. So, we, so it, it is, it's a funky thing. It wouldn't be all that different than an away game up in Berlin. Right. Or, or a Sunday yeah. night prom, honestly, although, you know, but so I, I can talk to Chris and see, and then the prom committee and see, would it be better to put our deposit and hope and maybe lose it or, or just put them off and say, we won't know for two weeks and we'll get back to you on When's your next meeting? It's the 18th. Exactly, 18th. You know, I'll be in touch with you on the 18th of March and hope that that date hasn't been taken. On 19th, just so you know, 19th. Okay. Yep. <laughs> and the, the kids and, and Chris and I can make that decision which route we go, whether we risk the money or if we just go. But if you need the time to think, then I would, I would prefer that you have thought it all out um, because honestly, more heads are better. Um, you may think of something that we haven't come up with that 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 is an issue or is a great thing. Good. Francie, we should make sure that you share this recording with Mr. Chamberlain so that the board can have access to it um, so that you can review any and, and have any questions. Trace, you just read my mind. That was exactly what I was going to ask for because this is helpful to be able to look through it. Absolutely. Again. Can, um, and we'll we, put the um, we'll put the website of the barn on it because there are even more pictures and you can see how incredibly I mean it's huge, it really is a large space. Can we go to the, the the last page of the presentation again and just make sure that there are no other questions on there that we have to do further work on, uh, as far as the board is looking for more information. So we're still in the planning stage as far as the first bullet. Um, you know, if we could get some guidance around whether or not guess from outside the district is something the board is either comfortable or not with, that would help us moving forward. I would I mean, be a lot more, I, sorry, Jim. No, no, please, Rob, go ahead. I would be a lot more comfortable if it was kids within the school. I think, you know, Trisha's point about knowing the kids is really important, and that's not necessarily true if we're outside of the school. And, so, and, and oftentimes some, well, I shouldn't say oftentimes, sometimes those dates are, are older as well. I mean, I'm generally more comfortable with, with it to sort of the Rob's point of being um, in town and, and not expanding um, outward. And it's hard to control, like if, if it's a student from you know, Webster, um, you know, versus a student from, you know, man, I think it's hard to then start drawing boundaries. So it feels to me like just keeping it in the school feels like a, a better alternative. I and mean, yes, I guess my only question is, is like, if they're already seeing each other outside the district, how is it any different that they're gonna be seeing each other in at the prom? Well, because there's 149 other students there. So if they're infected from there, I'm, no, I'm just, just trying yeah. to wrap my head around um, both you and Rob, okay. And then uh, what about tests? Um, in regards to temperature checks, questionnaires for the for the graduation, just for reminding uh, what we did there, uh, we had the questionnaire in the morning that the students and the families filled out prior to attending. Is that something the board would want us to do again? Um, it's you know we are, we've already done the form with the forms easy. We just have to update it, and if that's something that the the board would like us to do, I'm sure we could dig that form back up. Yeah, I feel like we have a 
a pretty good protocol for, you know, even for our sporting events for, you know, temperature checks and, and, um, and the questionnaire, those feel appropriate. And, um, and we already have some of those systems in place, or at least I think we're used to doing those. And so that feels like something we should do. It's, it's a school event. Um, I'm not so sure about the COVID test. That feels like a little above and beyond, but again, that's just me. I don't know how others feel. I actually, I like the idea of, of having PCR tests. Um, I don't know what the costs involve. I know Trish, you mentioned that it would be maybe not terribly, terribly expensive, but I think if we're gonna entertain having 160 people in one, you know, inside and outside in one location, I, yeah, I don't know, I, dancing, I don't know. For, for me, I think the PCR test would, would be an additional measure. I mean, it's, it's screening. So it's, it's an additional COVID-19 protection measure. Um, if we're probably in this case, not gonna ha necessarily have six feet of, of space between kids. Amy Cook, that, that was her first suggestion to me when I talked to her about this was that she felt pretty strongly that if we tested Thursday, asked kids to quarantine between Thursday and Sunday. So that would mean remote classes Thursday and Friday for anybody going to prom. Um, and then, then, you know, tested them again on Sunday that we'd have a bit more clarity about, um, about who we have. And I mean, it's the, the, the reception for Judge Amy Comet Barrett at the White House is an example of everyone was tested and it still became an event. However, um, it does give just a little bit, one more level of security. And she didn't think it was terribly expensive at this point to purchase that many tick, that many tests. That may be a, <clears throat> not to revisit, but see, this is why I like to think, but. Um, that may be the way to, to reconsider outside guests is if they are COVID tested. I mean, there are colleges and universities that are testing kids twice a week and that's keeping them rolling. So if you're from outside the district and you get a test on Thursday and on Sunday and you're negative, I don't know, thinking out loud. All right, we'll make sure that this is available to all of you. Um, Francie, we'll add the, the website of the barn so they could take a look too. So, so yes on tests. Okay, let's, let's get like a price for it. Into. Yeah, let's get a price for it and, and, and see what it is, and we'll keep planning as we go. Okay, great. Well, thank you, um, Francie, uh, for the presentation and for for really working and thinking through this. Um, this is this is great. Um, it's hard, so I, I I know how hard it is. So I really appreciate it. Um, and it would be great to be able to put something together um, for the junior and senior class. So um, it's encouraging, um, but keep working at it. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And so it sounds like uh, just to conclude, so in, um, you guys are gonna continue to plan, work with the venue, and then we'll have this on the agenda again in two weeks. And so um, we'll welcome you back and, and um, kind of continue the conversation and see what you learn um, and then, Rob can think over the next two weeks and we'll see, uh, we'll see how far we can get, but really appreciate it. Great, thanks so much. And I look forward to being demoted. <laughs> I'm gonna demote you, right? There you go, I'm demoting you as we speak. And then, and Mr. Kelly, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Hope I didn't over, over, hopefully I didn't over demote. No, I think you did a good. Um, it's so hard. I mean, kudos to them for, for all the thought that went into the planning, but you know, how hard is it to put together a prom in a pandemic? So, um, it's pretty amazing times. Uh, so Steve, the uh, decision maker matrix. And Andrew already uh, did a quick review. Yeah. Um, we, the number is 18.3 on the average seven day average cases, which puts us at accelerated spread. Um, we also are doing some CDC work too with the, with the matrix because we have some uh, ADA issues that we're using CDC. So we were tracking all that, but yes, we still have, uh, we're still at accelerated spread. And Steve, okay. that's based on Merrimack County, right? Yep, you got it. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, 
anything else on on operating and learning in a pandemic that was a lot and so any other thoughts or, or questions or concerns before we move on all right so we'll move on to um our next big event coming up which is an annual meeting um that we're scheduled to put on so uh steve i'm gonna i think i hand it over to you for materials and, and anything on information sure, sessions very quickly, thank you to Andrea who and everybody who collaborated on the mailing, which is going out, if not probably out today, right? Um, Andrea, it'll be yes, arriving. I, I, I verified that it was in put in the post yesterday, so it should be hitting mailboxes today and tomorrow. Uh, and, um, and so this is our last meeting before um, the first session, which will be a week from Saturday, um, uh, right, which will be the 13th. Um, and at nine o'clock, and we have some planning meetings, just making sure, and we'll work on the um, the pledge allegiance and the and the protocol, all that piece. And then we head to the Wednesday, um, which will be information session two. And then Thursday is our last. That would be um, Seth's last board meeting and the last meeting of this board. And then we move to the twentieth, which will be the all day vote. And um, Michelle's already assured of a beautiful day because we bought a box of hand warmers. Uh, and toe warmers, the biggest box we could we could purchase, which means it's going to be 80 degrees and sunny. So thank you, Michelle. Good job in assuring of that. Uh, anything else that uh, if you need uh, any idea, anything to make, you know, to, or, or I talked to uh, Dulcie today about getting the, the band back together, so to speak, and, and start that um, planning for the 20th. So um, this is really just to make sure if there's anything you think we need to make those days and those times go smooth, please let us know. And I think I did put the a mailing in the packet. Um, so I think you've all seen it with the dates um, and we're firing up. Steve, my only, and, and maybe James mentioned this and uh, just, I don't remember. So I know, so on Saturday, we'll give our, our um, do go over the warrant, um, do public comment um, on that. People can ask questions. And then we have uh, emails and other ways to communicate to us. And then on Wednesday, we'll get together. And James, is, is James, I mean, there's going to be a lot of information. Um, we assume there may be a lot of information shared. It, James, James is going to consolidate that for us and sort of present it or help us walk through that. Right. Is that true? Okay. Yeah. And we're meeting, we're going to, uh, we're meeting with James, I think next Tuesday. Uh, uh, and, and we'll, we will go through everything. We we'll make sure we're all on the same page. Anything he needs, make sure all the emails are up and forwards and all that fun stuff. But yeah, um, that's the work. And, and um, as you said, public comment Saturday, public comment during the public comment period. And then Wednesday really is a work session for the board to assimilate the public comment. And if there are any amendments to the to the article and then Thursday and right, we developed the, um, the actual ballot um, with James and with, with, the, with the group and then Make sure there's a lot of copies ready for the vote because this year the ballots have to be filled out at the site. Thank you. That's perfect. Everybody and, okay? And the one other piece that we can add is that we did, um, Matt Stone did put up the hopkindenschools.org slash school meetings. So all of this information is already posted online. The, the Zoom link is there. Um, the YouTube links are there. Everything is up. I mean, you can't join the meeting because it's not happening yet, but you can read through everything um, on, on the website as well. Nice. Thank you to Matt. All right. Um, I just lost my place. I apologize. So next up is uh, the building, right, the building committee update. And so um, I'm going to hand it over to Norm to talk about the meeting of March 2nd, and then um, we have some decisions to make. Yeah, I'm just bumping up Jay. Hopefully I nailed him. Hopefully I go. Look at yeah. that. So Jay, thanks for joining us. So um, I'll say it over and over again to the town of Hopkinton. Thanks for allowing us to have a, this project. You know, it's been a great um, year in this pro in this progress. And thank you to this board for implementing it. You know, I must say um, it has been a great great, great, great year where we're starting to see a lot of work done at Harold Martin and all our schools and for it to continue to improve. Um, one of the most important things um, before we discuss adults was to ensure that we kept the promise to the taxpayers that everything that was in the bond was completed. And so Steve, Michelle, and Jay, and I, we had a meeting and we went through 
And we had a discussion about making sure that the promise that was committed to this to this town was fulfilled because you don't have a discussion on adults until you know that we did this and we achieved the, the, the goal of what was promised in the bond. And I'm pleased to say that we did. Um, it, was a, it was a great progress to make sure that we did that and we continue to move forward with additional resources for this project. project. So a lot of work went into the first part, which was phase one. We got fire suppression. We were very fortunate to be able to get a grant from the, from the state and that was the first thing that this board agreed to um, as part of the project as an adult at $209,000. Now uh, we move um, towards a very important part, which is um, the second phase of adults for the facility project. And as you know, um, at this time, the building committee had some time to be able to look at the additional resources from this project and determine what was best um, for the district, which helps alleviate pressure on the CIP add on additional things for the district that maybe we, won't, we wouldn't be able to do. And it just continues to improve and, can, and, and continues to grow. But as you know, a lot of people put a lot of time and effort into this. You know, I, I you know, from, from Dave Luno to Liz Durant, Jim, to you, Jim, to this board, seeing it through, um, there's, there's three people here on the screen who did a lot of work, you know, from Michelle to Steve to Jay Burgess. And I asked, I asked Jay to come to the meeting tonight because you know he, he was the captain of this in the beginning. And for him to see this come into fruition for me is so important because for us to have an, an opportunity to have $485,000 of additional resources to put into this project, to trust our, our leadership team to look at what's best for the district. Um, I had to bring the man himself here to kind of get, give you guys a little bit of a thought process and rundown of what we have uh, moving forward in this phase two that the building committee recommended. I'll turn over to you, Jay. Thanks, Norm. I uh, appreciate it. Thanks for the kind words. It's um, Again, it's really been a team effort all the way through. So I, I just happen to be the one that has been fairly visible on this, but we, we need to keep in mind the the dozens of people that were involved in the original plan and then the, the people that have participated on, particularly the people that are part of our current team, the construction manager, our owner's project uh, representative, and um, our, our, our uh, construction manager and architect firm. So we really got a good group. Uh, speaking to the project, um, and I'm gonna kind of cover some ground here. I, some of the stuff I had mentioned to, to Norm and Rob earlier, but what would have been probably best for Jay and the facility steering committee originally would to be to have this project come in 75 cents less than what we had projected. Uh, that would have been great for our ego. We would have, we would have just, just been, we were almost there, but still under budget. But for a number of reasons, we've come in quite a bit less than that. Um, the, as we've worked through and, and, and double checked and make sure we've, we've addressed pretty much everything that we had promised, uh, we have the, the balance currently at about a little over $400,000. I think it's $440,000. And that's really a result of three things. Um, the first one is we've been lucky, and I guess to some extent, if you can call doing a building project during a, a, a worldwide pandemic lucky, I'll take it. Because we've seen some, not only did we not see the escalation in costs that we had anticipated, we saw some, some really super pricing. Um, if you take a couple steps back with me, a lot of this work we, we priced in um, May and June when um, a lot of the construction in Boston had been suspended, they, they closed for uh, from the middle of March until June. So uh, a lot of the, the construction activity that was driving a, a super hot construction market evaporated almost immediately. Uh, when you look at year on year um, it, uh, construction in Boston, it's down 25%. So that really caused us to see some very, very good pricing. Um, for example, there's a just at the middle high school, the mechanical work, the heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and plumbing, uh, two very good contractors, both of whom I've got firsthand experience with my, with my work at the city. We saw our savings of $60,000 on, on just one bid. And that, that was one of many bids. So we really, we got some excellent pipe, uh, pricing on that. Even the steel work, which I was concerned about, we couldn't even price steel work, was down less, 10% less than we had anticipated. So. Uh, we had we had some very good pricing there. Uh, also, uh, we didn't find 
much um, contingency. There were, we, we built a big contingency in because we didn't know what we were gonna find. We didn't find much. Uh, we knew that we would find asbestos. The question how much we had to address was, was, was up there, but uh, we found very few uh, contingency items. Um, and probably the biggest thing as far as, as that scheduling goes is we also, uh, we did a lot of work while the students were out, which was not something we had anticipated but we really leveraged it to our advantage. So um, when you roll in that and the, the fact that of the grant opportunities, we, I think to date we've seen over $100,000 in grants. Uh, we had sprinkler system as, as Norm had mentioned. We had some, um, some money that went towards some of the year handling Harold Martin. So that shaved uh, over $100,000 off of the project. But I would say probably most importantly, we built an excellent team um, from the ground up, uh, when, when we engaged our architecture firm, uh, we had uh, uh, some really good luck with the Turner Group. Um, Doug Proctor, who's our project architect, um, immediately found a way to reconfigure the addition of Harold Martin that, um, that allowed us to actually get that fourth classroom and without any, um, without any lost cost. So uh, we won't say it didn't cost any more, but we, we were able to get four classrooms in for the price of four classrooms, which was great. Uh, and we've really got a good working relationship with our team. Everybody kind of pulls together and they find, you know, good innovative solutions uh, that have saved us money. Um, I think the probably the biggest example of that is the sprinkler system. The, uh, we challenge to be able to pull the pieces and the, the planning and the budgeting. And Michelle gets a lot of credit for this because I think a lot of this stuff happened at the I won't say the 11th hour, I think it was the 11th hour and 45 minutes, but it all was done and we'll receive that grant. So I think that's really huge. And, um, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't shout out to a couple of members in the community, uh, Ken Rubenstein and uh, Renella Lurier also really helped a lot. Uh, good solid community members that have allowed us to, to, to get this project in a place where now we can have the discussion, which I think we've all been looking forward to is what additional work can we get done? So um, I, don't, uh, I don't know what point I turned back to Norm, but uh, I'll run for another second or two here. Uh, I believe you see in, um, in your packets, there is a, a multicolored list <clears throat> which goes school by school and shows the items that uh, we've discussed. Uh, I don't know Can whether that's shared or not. Yeah. I, I don't have that Norm uh, quickly oh. shareable, but. Um, I think there we go. So this shows the, uh, the, the different um, items we have. Uh, the items in green we'll call phase one. Those are the ones that have already been embarked on. Uh, phase two are in yellow. And uh, that's the, what we are recommending tonight. And phase three, um, there is just a brief bit of explanation. Uh, because the project is not complete, we're not near, we're, we're, I would say we're well past halfway, but we still have a ways to go. Um, we are still holding contingency money back. Uh, we don't know what we may find as we get into the, the demolition of the high school um, science labs. There are still things that can come up. So uh, in order to, to, to make sure we remain on, on budget, uh, we are going to keep contingency back probably until to July. At that point, we will probably have a similar discussion about how we, um, we allocate whatever funding may remain for what we will call phase three. Um, I would suspect at that point we'll present another set of recommendations that we can discuss. But the, this is probably tonight is probably the meatiest part of it. These will be the projects that we really need to embark on now in order to make sure that we can be complete by the end of the, the project in September. So um, as you'll see, and I won't go through them all, but uh, um, it was, uh, we, we had the balance, we went through the list of priorities and you'll see a, um, a, what I think is a fine mix of, uh, deferred maintenance, it's uh, mostly deferred maintenance, but there's also some uh, important programming things there to address some of the needs that the educators on the committee have brought up. Uh, specifically the computer lab renovation and the, the work at the, um, at, the, at the middle high school in the music room. Both of those are, uh, are I think kind of exciting for the people that are, that are in the building, um, but keeping in mind that we're addressing, you know, some pretty serious deferred maintenance issues. Uh, if we go way back, to the, the original project, the $30 million project, we had uh, over $6 million in deferred maintenance identified to be addressed as part of that project. And in this project, as it stands now, we've touched probably uh, a little more than a third of that. So we've done about $2 million in deferred maintenance, $2.3 million, I believe. So 
Um, there's plenty more out there. Uh, my feeling, and I think it's shared by by members of the of the building committee, is that if we address deferred maintenance where we can, it'll take pressure off the CIP going forward. So we'll revisit all these conversations again in a couple of months when I think everybody would be a little bit more comfortable looking at releasing some of that contingency money. So um, that was pretty much everything I had to say. Uh, I'm certainly happy to answer any specific questions and um, I'll, I'll throw it back to Norm in case I missed something. No, Jay, that's why I had you I come tonight. That was great, thank you very much. Um, just, just so the board knows, we have about, right now in contingency is about $200,000. So, um, you know, a lot can be, a lot can be released hopefully in July. And then as Jay said, we would come back um, in July and we discuss phase three. So we, in all the stages of this prog 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 project, we have come back to the board for approval for each specific phase. Um, with that, you know, the building committee made this recommendation um, and I'm very happy with how it was vet vetted. And mostly importantly for me was Steve's leadership team knew, knew what they need for their for their um, for each building, and so with that, this addresses a lot of areas in each school, which I think is very appropriate for us to move forward with. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, no, don't thank me. Thank you, guys. This is um, a ton of work um, over such a long period of time. I'm looking at Jay, who's who's been living this um, and volunteering and helping us grind through this for years. So, Jay, thank you so much. Um, this is quite an accomplishment. I really appreciate it. It Question? is an action item tonight, just to make sure everybody's okay. Um, uh, to to, and then we'll start the ordering. It's now because to order and get everything ready for a summer install. Any, any questions um, from the board? On any of the items, or Andrea? I just, for many of them, or me, um, I just had a quick question um, about the the Maple Street School computer lab renovation. That seems great. It's, it's going to um, enlarge in about six feet, move the wall about six feet, redo casework, um, redo. It's, it's, a, it's a very funky space. Now, egress is a, a very difficult, it's a real challenge, egress, when that current space is filled with kids. Um, it's going to change the, the, in the vernacular. The teaching wall is going to change, and, and the flexible spacing will add it. So um, I know Karen Locke and, and, and Amy are really excited about that piece. No, I agree. That was just one that caught my eye that I thought was a, a particularly great ad. Um, so for the board, any um, any hesitation on the action item? Does everybody feel comfortable with it and with, with this list of, of um, additions? Perfect. Um, Thank you, Jay. For yeah, coming. I appreciate it. No, my pleasure. Uh, we've got we've got it this far. We we look forward to uh, having a similar presentation in July and uh, put a big bow on it. Nice. And, and you guys are still confident that um, that come end of August we're going to be we're going to be completing and being in good shape. Yeah, we're on schedule. Uh, you know, like everything else, there are certain issues that come up. Um, we we've been tackling them as they've come up. Uh, uh, supply chain issues have caused a little bit of grief here and there, but we've got good viable plan B's for a lot of this stuff. So uh, as we stand now, there's really, there's, there's nothing that's, that, that jumps up as a concern for being done on schedule. Um, you know, things can change, but we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it as they come up. Perfect. Well, thank okay. you so much, Jay. I'm going to demote you, but it's, it's not because of, you know, really it's nothing demote. personal. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> good night. And Norm, thank you too, uh, to Steve and Michelle and the leadership team. Um, I, I know that how much work has been put into this project um, and it's, it's great. So kudos. Um, all right, so we'll move on to personnel and see if I can hand it over to you for the, for the three, um, two action items and a discussion. Sure, just uh, real quick, we're pleased to bring George Sable forward as the permanent sub. Um, this is a position that we have advertised for for a while. Um, we've had one pop in and one pop out early in the year, but this will continually support um, our ability if we have to quarantine or if we have to isolate things like that. So it's, it's welcome. It's great to bring George. George has been uh, a coach with us before and is certainly a fixture in our community. So um, welcome to George. He's also on the nominee for the next piece, which is our spring coaches. Um, and it is that we did, um, we, it, based on COVID, where we're at, the assistant coaches are part of this nomination, including George as an assistant track. So those are both action items tonight. 
happy to see George come aboard. I just kind of chuckle a little bit because he just retired from one job and now he's coming to the district. So <laughs> welcome we didn't aboard. leave him isolated. We didn't leave him. And those people were not move much. I mean, we we put him right to work. So it's yeah, yeah. I know it's great. I just thought it was fun. Thank you. And uh, just every once in a while, I'll continue to provide a kindergarten update. Um, we have, uh, I checked in today, we have 45 um, registered kindergartners. And uh, last year at this time, we had 39. So we're a little ahead of our pace. And, and, you know, obviously this is a three section, four section, usually discussion where we are as we go. But I think we're on pace for our traditional four sections. But we'll keep you updated every other meeting or so and see how it's going. But we're at 45. Any questions on any of those items? All right, um, so we'll keep trucking along and uh, the school board schedule that was in our packet. And, and just the only, the only, Michelle and I spoke, um, originally this is, we were planning three public hearings back to back to back because we've got to fit them all into SEF. No, um, the, we were planning on an S or two public hearing to receive federal funds, but we haven't quite solidified the number yet. And so as soon as we get that direction from the DOE, then we'll plan it. It doesn't make too much sense to have a public hearing and not know much yet. <laughs> so, um, but Michelle and I will keep you posted. So that'll be a change on the schedule, but everything else is, is systems go. And I'll continue to update that schedule now through. And as I alluded to, Seth will have one more meeting. Um, that'll be the 18th. And then um, the next meeting after that will be April 1st. And that'll be the meeting of the new board. And we're going to get right into, you know, um, we'll be discussing HEA nominations and, and all that fun stuff. So, um, but I will do my best to keep the board up to date or updated on the schedules for your planning for your calendars. Sounds good. Any, any questions or comments on the calendar? Steve, I appreciate you putting that in the packet every couple of weeks. It's, it's great to be able to look ahead at that. So um, thank you. So no five o'clock meeting next week, uh, next meeting, just so you know. Don't speak too soon, Steve. <laughs> that's true. That's <laughs> um, all right. So next up is financial. And we had a uh, public hearing before this meeting at five o'clock to discuss items for withdrawal from the building, um, the building repair and maintenance fund. And so I guess um, we didn't have any public comment. And so I just would uh, just ask the board if they have any comment. And if not, this is an action item. Um, and just make sure everybody's is feeling good and prepared for that. All thumbs up, that's a good sign. Um, all right, and we have some accepting the funds. And so that's always a good thing. So Steve. And I, I appreciate um, this agenda item. Michelle and I work very closely together. Um, and this is really, it's, it's a procedural, but it's an important and it's, and it's a public opportunity. So when the district receives funds, uh, our policy says um, that we have to formally accept it. So tonight, I, I, uh, hopefully you saw the memo in, in, the, in, in the packets. Uh, honored, always honored to, to, to lead or organize and facilitate the selection of the Susan Graham Brzezinski Award. And so $2,000 have been received. And what Michelle and I are working on, um, there's actually some uh, funds in excess that we've held. We're actually return those back to the Hampshire Charitable Foundation so they can go back into the fund and earn interest. Um, we're, we're tidying that up. Um, and, and the Susan Graham Brzezinski Award was started actually my first year in district. The first award winners were in the, the spring of 2000. So, um, and coming out soon will be our newsletter. And part one of the big pages in the newsletter is every single Susan Graham Brzezinski Award winner is, is out. So that's coming. Um, we also receive health trust dollars. It's just a part of our health insurance. It's five hundred dollars for each school. So we'll accept that tonight. And I appreciate working with uh, the new trustee of the trust fund, Steve Lux. He, he and I have been in, in, in discussion. And Neil Cass always supports us. So uh, just procedurally. Um, the, the, dis the district needs to just accept um, the scholarship funds. And then typically we turn the funds over to the charitable trust, uh, sorry, to uh, the trustee of the trust funds in Hopkinton. And they do the disbursement each year regarding the, the scholarship. But um, we have um, established the Houghton Trust, which supports a world language exchange. That was a, a bequeath or bequeath that, uh, that someone had left that scholarship when I was early in my superintendency. Um, this year is a new scholarship started to honor Lish Cross in, in her experience. So that's a new scholarship. Um, uh, we have the Slusser Student Growth Scholarship. Um, that is, is for any student and it provides some unique opportunities like Outward Bound and things like that. So we're accepting that funds. And the Sherry Morrill Scholarship is also new this year to honor Sherry in her world. 
kind of work and her experience in the community. And going back, uh, just to, to make sure we had a, a, a action item in the record, Travis Aubrey Scholarship. Um, that was established for Travis, who was one of our students, uh, one of my students when I was there um, to honor his memory. So um, it'll be really nice to have all this codified and supported and working with Steve to make sure the funds get there for, for their purposes and their ability to grow and disperse through the funds. So thank you for allowing um, this procedural work and, and certainly to give some credit publicly to some great work and, and working with people on scholarships is one of the joyous things I do. Any questions for Steve on any of those? All right, and those will be action items. Um, thank you, Steve. That was a great intro. Thank you. All right, so we have um, we've gone through the agenda. So we're now at the um, second public comment portion of the meeting. And so I would just ask if anybody who is attending wishes to provide public comments that uh, if you move your cursor down towards the bottom of the screen, there's a raise your hand button. Um, you can click on that and that'll let us know that you have a public comment. And I would just ask that you give us your name and address um, for, the, for the record and then um, uh, try to keep your comments around three minutes. Uh, that would be great. And I tried to bump up Seth. Oh, I think oh. he's in the ether in the world right now. You'll find his way. Um, so I'm not seeing any hands for public comment. Nope. I have one, uh, two, there we go. Um, Darlene Gildersleeve. Can you hear me? I can. Oh, okay. Um, I have a hard time reading and talking fast, but I will um, absolutely try. Um, thank you, Dorm, um, for asking for the data um, to support the decision uh, not to reopen most of the um, classes to full time um, about the three foot distancing and running some hypotheticals. Um, I think that's a great idea, you know, to, I think it's really important to have that data and also to post it publicly on the website for parents to go over. Um, I also wanna thank Norm for bringing up outdoor classes in the spring. I know I've heard that um, from other districts and it's it was, great actually in the fall. So I think it's something that the district can really look towards in the spring. And um, I think another great idea is if board members can actually call private schools themselves and actually learn and explore how private schools have been open full time um, since the very beginning of September with no outbreaks at all um, that were reported. Um, I think that would be good. Um, and so no answer on this question is really needed now. Um, but if kids are approved to do indoor sports, um, which happens to be less than six feet apart, and especially without masks or even with masks, uh, why can't they be masked and in school in person to be educated? Um, and why are sports prioritized more than in-person education? Um, especially in Hopkinton, I find that um, much to my disbelief that, you know, I just really feel that sports are um, put before anything else. And I'm very concerned for kids that don't play sports. The opportunity for socialization seems uh, non-existent for those kids. And it really seems like they're being penalized for not playing sports. And it just seems really unfair that they can't go back to school. Um, not all kids with 504 and IEPs who need and really, I mean, really need in-person learning are getting their needs met. Last, um, earlier um, last week, Principal Kelly said that there just wasn't enough room to accommodate um, the kids with special education needs that had to go back. Um, I asked the board members to please take a look at the state testing scores for our kids with free and reduced lunches and IEPs. Um, myself and another parent had asked um, Steve Chamberlain to prepare that report, and that report was presented to the board just before COVID. Um, it's run by the DOE under aggregated data. And um, again, it's for kids who get free and reduced lunches and IEPs. If you'll please take notice of the fifth grade test scores, they were in the eighth percentile. And um, 
it, it was just unacceptable. If these kids who were already in the eighth percentile for testing scores before COVID are not brought back for in-person learning now, you can just imagine how negatively these kids, our most vulnerable population, will be impacted. My hope, and I asked this before to the school board um, a couple of, of different times, um, is that a case manager in every single grade would be fully accountable for test scores for kids with special education IEPs and for um, ADA 504 plans, that they're fully accountable by providing, going over the test scores and communicating with parents before the kids fail the classes. Unfortunately, special education students are still failing without any accountability to educators and case managers. Okay, and then um, Mr. Kelly just brought up um, the New England um, Accreditation Board. Why is a formal communication plan that is being recommended by a body of peers for special education and communication between teachers being rejected? A formal plan can really uphold quality and accountability, especially at the high school. Freshmen and sophomores with IEPs are especially having a tough time. Please consider accepting recommendations from this professional organization rather than rejecting it. There's really good reason why they're recommending it in the first place. I ask that test scores, pass-fail rates, IEP compliance, measuring against goals, and progress reports in regards to maintaining IEP goals are looked at hard before the board decides to reject the recommendations of this professional association. That's a very important thing because my son who's now 21 years old um, had a terrible time in high school. And when I shared his experience, other parents reached out to me about their special education kids, again, especially mm. freshman and sophomore year um, that are failing, being held back or being forced to repeat mm. one full year of classes. Uh, and it's still, it's still happening. So um, it, again, Jim, I have... I think I already told you, I do have a disability that makes it very hard for me to talk and to read quickly. So, um, and I know you have no other hands up and no other people that want to talk, like you said. So I'm going to hurry up and spit it out, but well, I have a really hard time. I, um, I appreciate it. I, I understand, Darlene. Um, but we I think I have like one paragraph left. Okay. Um, let's see. In, a, um, it's, in addition, it's really important for high school special education case managers to actively communicate and collaborate, collaborate with parents before a child struggles badly. So please, again, please seriously reconsider rejecting the recommendations of a professional association. I think it's a really bad idea for the vulnerable special education kids in high school. Um, uh, lastly, um, to follow up about the New Hampshire School Board Association actively lobbying against the needs of our students in Hopkinton, if you could please let me know, and please let the people that are listening to the call know, how much is paid yearly to the district from taxpayer funds in order to then funnel the money to the New Hampshire School Board Association for these highly paid lobbyists to go against the needs of students and their families. And to get this dollar figure of how much is being paid to them, do I have to do a right to know request? Thank you, also, Darlene. Um, well, one, one last question. But, also, Darlene. has the district actively looked into other organizations to collaborate with? Thank you, Darlene, for your comments. I appreciate it. Sure. Um, next hands up is Jen. Hi, can you hear me? You sure can. Hi, I just wanted to um, thank um, Principal Carroza and um, Superintendent Chamberlain and everyone and Michelle Clark for getting the um, grant um, to allow those um, kindergarten and for first graders to come back. 
um, full time or to hopefully come back full time. So I'm really happy that plan is going forward. Um, I had to bite my tongue and not tell my kindergartner just in case it doesn't work out. Um, but I know that she will be thrilled. Um, she has even asked to do kindergarten again next year. Um, <laughs> she feels she hasn't gotten kindergarten. Um, so yeah, so she will just be thrilled if that happens. Um, and I just had a thought on um, a couple ways to possibly encourage parents to volunteer to switch, um, possibly moving one of the IAs from one of the classrooms that some kids are familiar with um, to the new teacher. I, if I'm correct, I believe each kindergarten teacher has a teaching assistant that um, isn't assigned to specific students, but just to help the whole class. So if, um, am I correct on that? Do you know, does anyone know? Yeah, um, roughly, yes, yeah, Jen, roughly. Yeah. The second adult yeah. Class. Okay, yeah, so maybe like I, for example, like I know that my kindergartner absolutely loves the teaching assistant in her class. Um, so, you know, if I happen to know that that teaching assistant would be with a new teacher, that may make me as a parent more likely to volunteer. Um, so it was just a thought I had. Um, and then, of course, I do have to um, just push the reading and whoever you guys look to hire. I know that there's a huge workforce shortage and it's hard to hire people right now, but um, just, you know, really trying to find um, a kindergarten and first grade teacher that really understand the science of reading and really embrace that um, and, you know, have some experience with foundations, which you guys use, um, would be absolutely wonderful. And, um, and that would be, you know, sharing that information with parents the, a little bit. I know you guys can't share a ton of the background of teachers that get hired, but um, you know, maybe sharing, if you can share anything, share anything like that with parents that may encourage parents to um, volunteer to switch. Um, so anyway, those were my thoughts. And, and thank you so much. Again. Okay. And we'll keep our fingers crossed along with you. Yep. <laughs> Have a good night. Um, next uh, hand is Jacob Ross. So I have to, um, Jacob, just so you know, I got to promote you to panelist for your version. So we may see you. I hope that's okay. <laughs> Jay Ross, nice to see you. See you. Uh, nice to see you as well. Uh, Jacob Ross, 834 Main Street. Um, I just wanted to uh, do a big shout out to, to Bill and his staff for coming up with that unique um, uh, solution for the K-1. And uh you know, somebody, one of, one of the board members had said you, that that probably put a big smile on uh, a lot of parents' faces, and that, that was my face for sure. Um, I think that, you know, th there's a concern that you might not get enough people to volunteer. I think uh, if I, I don't want to speak for my daughter, but I think if I said you get to go five days a week, she would say, who are my new classmates? You know, <laughs> that's kind of the response. I don't, I don't think that that would, um, I think there's definitely at least a, a dozen um students who would probably feel comfortable doing that and have the personality for it. And the only other comment I had was um, I work at a local area high school and, and we do the three feet. We're going back to a, um, f a five day um, in uh, next week, next Monday. And, and with the three feet with the mass, um, when, when the question is asked, um, is it possible to even get like you have a high school classroom? My classes are, have students, with as many as 24 students, um, not all of those students are gonna wanna come back. I've had at least a handful, half dozen students that have been s just learning synchronously um, the entire year, because that's what they're feeling comfortable with. So even though um, my, I personally could not fit 24 students at three feet in my classroom, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that there would be a need for it. So I know that just makes the, um, makes the, the, the question of, is it possible even harder to figure out? But that was just something I thought of when, when that question and that thought came up. That's all I have. Jacob, thank you so much. I'm glad you're smiling. It's yeah. good to see. <laughs> have yeah. a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And you too, full, trans full transparency, he was my daughter's math teacher a couple of years ago. <laughs> um, next hand that's up uh, is uh, Jeremy Friedis.
Jeremy, you should be able to unmute yourself. Unmute. Okay, there, there we go. go. Good. Sorry about that. Hit the wrong button. No, you're doing Jeremy great. Jeremy Freitas, uh, 56 Old Henniker Road. Um, you know, Jacob, I think it obviously is absolutely possible. Um, I think we've been a very slow to respond school board. Um, uh, yay, my kindergartner can actually get into the classroom, maybe um, April. Um, I just wonder, you know, with so many other area schools looking to reopen full, um, what's the thinking with the slow play? Like three weeks out, four weeks out, hire new teachers, lock ourselves into some kind of crazy commitment when all indications are much better than this. Mm -hmm. And so I'd ask like, could we consider something better than this? I mean, it just seems like we're slow playing, getting our kids back in the classroom. And um, so where's the alternate plan? I would like to actually see what we can do with three foot distancing in a month from now. Is that even being considered? And thank you, uh, Mr. Goopel for you know having a spine to dissent. It's okay to have a dissenting opinion. It's okay that you guys don't all walk lockstep because it seems like if anybody is falling out of line in this school board group, like, oh, that's like shunned. No, it's, it's actually okay to not agree. And so thank you for raising this question because obviously it is the elephant in the room that we're somehow not discussing. So I guess I'll be the bad guy and just say, can we please discuss it? I'm muted. So thank you, Jeremy, for your, am I still muted? No, I'm not. So thank you for your comments. I um, appreciate it. And we'll have more discussion on this topic. One to four. I don't know the actual number. Current cases. Oh, I'm not talking. I'm sorry. I was talking. I was on mute. Um, I would say, Jeremy, thank you so much for your comment. We are discussing and we'll continue to discuss these issues. So I appreciate it. And next hand up is Sarah Matz and Dustin. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for the really thoughtful and creative planning around the kindergartners and the first graders. Um, it was just wonderful to hear that potential plan. I know it may be tricky to pull it off, but I wish everyone the best of luck and really appreciate uh, all of the effort that went into coming up with that idea. Um, I wanted to ask a question. I was overjoyed today when I learned that my sister, who is a first grade teacher in uh, Campton up in Grafton County, um, has already gotten through her school's partnership with their regional public health network, her appointment dates for her first and second vaccinations. And so I was curious if we have any sense of when the educators in our school district will have a similar opportunity to get vaccinated. Steve, I don't know if you have an answer. I mean, I, I don't, and I haven't heard of any scheduling. So I don't know, Steve, if you have any different information. I think there was some communication from uh, Nicole Masters today regarding some dates and things, but I've been in meetings all the way through. So, um, Sarah, I don't know uh, about uh, any opportunity for regional uh, uh, health network, but uh, we will certainly look into that and see where, but I, I thought Nicole had some dates for us to look for um, vaccination for teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Um, let's see. Next hand that has gone up is uh, Susan Zankel. Hi, Susan. You should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, Jim. This is Mark, actually, Zankel, using, my phone. using Susan's phone. Can you hear me? We sure can. And we can see Susan. So it's, um, it's a twofer. Great. <laughs> I'll take the credit, maybe. Uh, yes. Uh, so anyway, yes, uh, Mark Zankel, 45 Crowell Road. Um, I wanted to thank you, Andrea, for just the great overview that you gave earlier um, on the, the update on you know, CDC guidance and how you all are considering that and that you have ongoing conversations, regular conversations with the school board, with the administration, with the, the HEA about um, return to school options. I'm glad that the uh, intention is to have all students and teachers in the classes, you know, as of the fall and earlier, as you said, if possible, that's good to hear. 
Um, you know, just a couple observations. It strikes me that, you know, I think our school, the school board has erred on the side of safety throughout this school year. And um, it's really hard to get this right. As you all know, I've generally felt like that, that erring on the side of public safety during the pandemic has been the right call with lots of costs to it. We all understand. Um, and, you know, now as we kind of get to this point um, and trying to balance, you know, the health of our students related and their families and, you know, with uh, related to COVID with mental health and mental health has been talked about a lot and all the educational, um, you know, implications of not being there in person. I, it strikes me that the calculus around risk is starting to shift a bit. And then as you add in the increase in number of people, of elderly people and soon to be teachers who are gonna be vaccinated, that it's start, you know, it's continuing to shift um, that risk reward calculus. Um, so the question that I wanted to put to you, not so much to answer tonight, but that I think would be helpful is, it would, I think it'd be really nice if you were able, you were able to spell out what are the circumstances and conditions and metrics that would need to be met in order for you to feel like we could go um, more in person, whether it's all in person or just more than we are doing now. You know, what are the thresholds that we need to meet in terms of teacher vaccinations, in terms of transmission rates? Because um, I think if, if the community knew that, um, they would know what are the benchmarks we need to hit in order, you know, for the school board to say, yes, we can go more in person than we are now. So that's what I would love to see. I know it may be easy to ask for it, hard to do, um, but I think that'd be beneficial. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, appreciate your comments. And so um, it's not a complete answer, but I'll give a partial answer because uh, Andrea did mention it in her um, opening remarks is that you know, the, we have been following uh, CDC guidelines and recommendations, and you could you can find those um, on the CDC website. And there's all sorts of versions of it that you can find in, in newspapers or, or in other places that's, that lay out um, that lay out some of those decision making around community the level of community spread um, and when um, and when and how uh, mitigation occurs for that. So um, that is one place that I think uh, you can look and find the CDC guidelines and recommendations for schooling. And you'll find that our practices have been um, consistent with those guidelines. And that's been something that the board, our administration, our nurses um, have been encouraging and following through on. So appreciate that. Um, uh, I would, I, I guess I would ask if, um, if you've provided comments and you haven't lowered your hand that you do so. Um, All right, just got a, a mixture of hands going down and coming up, so I apologize. So I guess um, I'll call on Susan Zankel again, which I think might be Mark Zankel. This is Mark Zankel. Thank you, Jim. I'm just going to follow up with, with one follow-up question, which is um, if, if those um, conditions um, you know, following the CDC's best guidance were met in terms of things like transmission rates, you know, our ability to have the spacing needed, et cetera. Is our, does our agreement, our current agreement um, with the HEA allow for us to return to full in-person? I'm not sure I'm asking the question exactly the right way. But I, you know, I think it's it's again of just trying to understand what are all the things that would need to be to happen, um, all the conditions. So if, if the health guide guidelines were met, would we be able to return to in person, or are there other things that would need to, for example, be renegotiated? Yeah. So we have a we have a health and safety memorandum of agreement with um, both the HEA as well as with Hess. Um, and so that is an ongoing conversation. And so, um, so that, that's, that's a factor as well as, as we mentioned the CDC guidelines and the recommendations. Um, so those are all sort of part of the, part of the picture that the board and the administration yeah, and others are working on. All right, so thank you. Thank you for 
trying to put me on the spot. Uh, all right. Um, so next hand that's up um, is, is Darlene Gildersleeve. And so Darlene, I just asked this would be your third time tonight. And, and if you could try to keep it to three minutes, that would be great. Uh, no, I didn't have my hand up for any more comments. Thank you. Oh, okay. So oh, you're welcome. Um, so another hand just came up with Mike Doherty. Um, this is Jane Doherty. I think you're probably oh. a little hard. Can you hear me? I sure can. Yeah. Go this ahead, Jane. Jane Doherty. Um, I'm at 573 Dustin Road. Um, and I just uh, finished putting children to bed, so I kind of missed some of the earlier, pub I think most of the public comment. Um, but, uh, and I, um, I think I might be asking a question that's already been asked or comment, um, but I'm just gonna put it out there anyway. Um, and it's just about the, the six feet of spacing as well, and if other considerations as far as when the spring comes and windows are open, um, you know, the role that ventilation plays with, uh, um, you know, reducing spread of COVID, um, teachers being vaccinated. Um, it just seems to me like a big undertaking and I'm not an educator, so I don't know what it takes to like onboard a teacher, um, you know, starting in April, um, if other factors would be taken into consideration, um, knowing that WHO has, uh, a recommendation of a meter distance between, at least a meter distance between students. American Academy of Pediatrics, three to six feet of, um, of distance. Um, and just the increasing data that's coming out showing the safety of, um, you know, that six feet is kind of, it's dogma and it's, it's been something that's been around for a long time, but there's other factors that need to be considered. Um, and if it makes sense to do, um, I don't know, rather than having a whole student and, and breaking up classrooms for the kindergartners and the first graders, um, considering having a, a, a more full classroom. Um, and I think I'm, you guys are probably beating a dead horse with this because it sounds like maybe the last person had commented on it. Um, Jane, thank you for the comments and um, I won't repeat um, everything that we said, but you know, the board is, um, the, the board's in discussions um, with the administration um, uh, and, and all these factors are being considered for how, how we move forward. Um, and currently, you know, we're, we are um, operating with the CDC recommendations and their guidelines that they've published um, and they've put out. So th that's our operating procedure, but all these other considerations are being discussed and factored as, and as we move forward. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, Amanda Gilman. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, first, my apologies for misunderstanding your um, intonations last meeting, Jim. Uh, it was very unclear to me, and I totally misinterpreted what you said, and I apologize for that. And my thanks to Andrea for her very direct and clear communication tonight. Uh, I very clearly hear, hear what you're saying, so thank you. Uh, and thanks to Norm for asking that we consider the three foot, ex uh, to consider, to explore three feet. Um, I definitely would like to see this considered, and I am sure that you probably are talking about this, just, um, and I realize that it's not a consideration right now. You are following guidelines right now. I think that's been made very clear, and no one's asking you to do anything different right now. Um, what I'm looking for, and I think what a lot of parents are looking for, is uh, some sort of plan um, for what conditions need to be met. And I, I think you're probably hearing this loud and clear. Um, but everyone's still very tight-lipped about where we're going with this or if anything is going to happen this year. Uh, and to have some sort of something to hold on to for parents of a, a metric like, well, if this, then this, if this, then this. And, and it's very much feels like heels are dug in right now and that we are not, this is not being considered for the rest of the year. And whether that's true or not, I have no idea. I, I just am trying to convey the frustration that it feels like, well, nope, we're not going to do it. Um, I do recognize and I appreciate that you're hearing the consideration for the littles, uh, kindergarten and first grade. I, I think that's awesome. Um, and I kind of wish second and third could also be included. Uh, I definitely wish um, because I think that they're struggling as well. So I appreciate that you are hearing people. 
I just ask that you continue to work on a, a plan, a forward plan for more than just September, that if things improve dramatically, if these metrics are met, we will be considering an alternative degree of getting more kids back in school. So um, I look very much forward to a proactive plan for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Appreciate it. Um, with that, we have no additional hands. And so I'm going to close the public comment and move to um, the action items. And um, what I will ask for the board, and we've been doing this our past couple of meetings. Um, we don't have a non-public scheduled or, or any issue that I know of to have a non-public, um, but we will. I will ask that we have a non-meeting following this meeting. Um, and for those who wonder what the heck a, a non-meeting is, uh, a non-meeting is a statutory guide, or at least it's in the statute under our public meeting guidelines for public bodies. Um, for negotiation purposes, boards can meet in something called a non-meeting, um, which, uh, which doesn't follow the same guidelines as, as uh, right to know. Um, and so they're not meetings that need to be actually noticed and or uh, minutes taken um, in this case, uh, I think the board is comfortable um, letting people know it's sort of a notice that we are going to go into a non-meeting um, following our regular meeting. So with that, um, I'm gonna pull up the action items here. And I would ask if there's a motion for the Hopkinton School Board to approve the superintendent's recommendation to withdraw the following funds from the Hopkinton School District Building Repair and Maintenance Fund, performance contract payment of 42,500, uh, MSS dishwasher and booster replacement of $14,500. MSS furniture at $1,310. HMHS furniture at $5,610. HMHS steamer at $6,500 for a total of $70,420. So moved. Any discussion on those items? Uh, seeing none, Rob? Rob Nato, yes. Andrea? Andrea Folsom, yes. Norm? Norm Pupil, yes. Seth? Seth A. Frame, yes. And Jim O'Brien is a yes, so that motion passes. Is there a motion for the Hopkinton School Board to accept the recommendations of the Building Committee and approve phase two additional alternatives as presented? So moved. I'll let second. Norm, move. I'll second it. Norm can move it. I'll second yeah. it. It's okay. Any discussion? Thank you. We'll let Norm go first. Norm Goopel. Absolutely. Yes. You gotta say your name. Oh, Norm Goopel. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Rob? Rob Nato. Yes. Andrew? Andrew Folsom. Yes. And Jim O'Brien is a yes. So that motion passes. We, we oh, also I'm sorry, do Seth. Have Seth. <laughs> Seth, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> the motion has now passed five to zero. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion for the Hopkinton School Board to approve the superintendent's nomination of George Sable, HMHS permanent substitute for the 2021 school year pending final approval of the superintendent of schools? I moved. Welcome back. Second. Any discussion? Seth. Seth A-frame, yes. Norm? Norm Kupel, yes. Andrea? Andrew Folsom, yes. Rob? Rob Nato, absolutely yes. <laughs> Jim O'Brien is a yes. Um, perfect. Is there a motion for the Hopkinton School Board to approve the superintendent's nomination of the spring athletic Schedule B nomination slate as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Andrew? Andrew Folsom, yes. Rob? Rob Nato, yes. Norm? Norm Kupo, yes. Seth? Seth A-frame, yes. And Jim O'Brien is a yes. That motion passes. And finally, is there a motion for the Hopkinton School Board to approve the superintendent's recommendation to accept the funds as presented? And um, uh, I assume that motion is OK. I just, as funds as presented, I'm just trying to think back. In the memorandum, um, yeah, it was the it's as presented in the memorandum. It probably would be better. Um, moved, or are you are you still reading it, or can I, I move it? I think you can move it. All right, I moved it. Is there a second? 
Norm, did you second that? I did second it. All yeah. right, things are things are falling apart here. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Normie. <laughs> All right, so the motion was made in second, and these are the donations in the memo that uh, Steve outlined uh, that we had discussed earlier. Um, any discussion? All right, Norm. Norm Gupo, yes. Seth? Does they frame yes. Andrea? Andrea Folsom, yes. Rob? Rob Nato, yes. All right, and Jim O'Brien is a yes, and so that motion passes. Um, any other business that anybody wants to bring up before we adjourn? All right, hearing none, um, thanks to everybody. Uh, Mia, thanks for, for sticking it out with us uh, to 8.30 tonight, we appreciate it. Um, and everybody have a great night. For board members, you should have an email um, for the link for the non-meeting, um, which if we could go to, it shouldn't take very long, I don't think. So if we could move there um, right after we adjourn here, that would be great. With that, thank you all so much. Have a wonderful night.